conversations. I think that Mary was at the same level. For you, I am I'm making up for this. Uh, and you might want to try something else. All right, I'm Tim and Ashley. Hey everyone, Matt Lanfer here with Primary and Secondary. Welcome to Primary and Secondary Podcast. We're going to be talking about fitness stuff today. It is episode 146, Fitness Lifestyle. Today's May 10th, 2018. Have a really cool panel to discuss this stuff. And again, as per the norm, I'm going to be just listening. I'm going to be learning because I don't have anything contrib- to contribute. Overweight guy in the 40s. Yeah, that's me. I'm going to be, I'm going to be taking notes. Um, Big thanks to Facts on Firearms. They're our uh, sponsor for the podcast. Uh, we do have a website at primaryandsecondary.com. We have a forum on primaryandsecondary.com slash forum. We're on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash primaryandsecondary. You can support this whole network. That covers a lot of stuff. We have all kinds of discounts, all kinds of stuff um, that can that can that helps pay the bills here. And then there are some benefits back to you. Um, Next week, we're doing an episode with uh, Jim Fuller of Rifle Dynamics. We're going to be talking about AKs, part selection, the importance of assembling things correctly. I attended his class last November. It was a great time. I really enjoyed working with Jim. He's been on the podcast before. He's returning. We're going to get in-depth with part selection, putting AKs together, all that kind of stuff. I can't wait. So uh, my background's in law enforcement. Firearm stuff, video game stuff. Um, I think I, I'm doing three podcasts now. That's a lot of talking. I need to shut up. Tomorrow I have a live podcast with uh, Carl Casarda, who's who's my little buddy. He actually, it's not little. He's my buddy in the, the podcast, No Future. We're going to be talking about Big Brother and the government and their role. And it's going to be it's going to be fun, especially with me being a cop. Yay. Um, I guess I'll I'll turn things over to to let people do some intros now i'll stop talking so i guess we'll, we'll let's start with varg hey thanks for having me on her um varg freeborn uh got uh for for the purposes of what we're going to talk about tonight my fitness background um i was uh, i grew up in uh with the need for a lot of physical activity so being in shape was uh, was was kind of important. Uh, I went on to become a professional personal trainer full time for a while. Um, 2005, I think I went pro. My first gym job was 1995. To, so 10 years later, I went professional and started getting paid and uh, basically worked that for several years in Tennessee, Ohio, Florida, and um, worked for several corporate gyms and and was involved in a lot of different combatives training and boxing and box, uh, golden gloves and stuff like that during that time too. And, um, and I've been involved in it ever since now, of course I run my, my firearms and defensive training company. So I do some combatives and hands-on and a lot of what I do is advising fitness and conditioning for, for self-defense and, uh, currently in the process of reopening my gym again, uh, now in Florida. So, and I, I definitely want to talk about uh, some of the conversation we had yesterday, talking about various focuses and how that incorporates into a mm-hmm. defensive lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And then we have Chris. Chris has joined us before. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Uh, my name is Chris Henderson. My background is uh, I'm a musician, a uh, professional musician by trade. Um, uh, my fitness background is uh, is pretty much just learned over the last five or so years of uh, just trying to figure that whole thing out. I mean, I really uh, just started down down the road on my own, blind, and just picked up little things here and there. And I've, I think uh, I've, after the after the last five years, I've kind of cracked the code on on being in shape and uh, and 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 excelling physically and um, and not uh, basically going the wrong direction. So. That's where I'm at with that whole thing. And it's uh, it's definitely a, a labor of love. And one of the reasons I thought it would be so cool to have you on there is, and we'll, we'll talk about this, is where you came from and where you're now. Sure. And to me, that's inspiring. Um, and the fact that this can be a an everyday guy can, can flip around like that is just awesome. Okay, awesome. Um, oh, also, we will have a nutritionist on probably in about an hour. Um, but until then, we have Amy. 
Thanks. I'm Amy Langdon. I work for a software company, and then I also help my husband, Ernest, run Langdon Tactical. I've seen lots of exciting things there, and I am a coach at CrossFit Obsession here in Mesa, Arizona. I got into fitness at a very young age, uh, starting competitively with baton twirling. Shh, don't tell anybody. I <laughs> um, was a competitive baton twirler, twirled at the University of Minnesota, and then when I finished that, um, did a lot like you, Chris, went into running, had to find things, was marathon running, and after having multiple knee surgeries and foot surgery, found CrossFit, vehemently fought doing CrossFit, uh, but was traveling in the law enforcement circuit in the industry and was kind of getting pulled in from many different directions. And now it's something that I love to do. And prior to this, you were with, was it Surefire? And was it DevTech? Oh. No, I worked for Recon Robotics and then Surefire and did a short stint in Combined Systems too. And then decided the industry is a little crazy and now here I am. Here you are back in it. Yeah. Right? You know, <laughs> that was so fun when we went and compared pistols at NRA. You enjoyed that. You I had did. fun. You had fun I doing did. that. Because we were yeah. both kind of snarky. Yeah, and I vehemently fought shooting a Beretta, and now I carry a PX4 compact carry. Yeah. I really didn't want to, but I do. <laughs> no, it's a good choice. And then we have Adam, who's out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, literally in the middle of nowhere. Well, hold on. Let me turn my camera on. I figure it's easier just to do it on the side of the road than drive. Oh, this is cool. Yeah, uh, I'm Adam Peeney, uh with Knights Harborment. Um, I got kind of serious about my health 13 or 14 months ago. Um, was not a, uh, a very active person, per se, for the 30 of my 31 years of life, even though I did like sports and stuff. But I didn't really give a, a shit about the stuff that I put in my body or like how I was how I should have been optimizing things. Uh, so some stuff changed last year and I got really focused on fixing myself. They are 20 pounds from when I started and it's a continual growth and yeah, I'm excited to, to do this. For, on my end, you, you, you broke a bit. Oh, how much have you lost so far? Uh, 120 pounds. Nice. And Adam, for you, what has been the biggest, what do you think the biggest aspect of this? What was the biggest change? Uh, it was kind of, it wasn't like one thing. It was everything. It was, uh, you know, first thing everybody says is diet, diet, diet. That's, that's a big part of it. You know, no, no sugar, no, no not a lot of sugars, um, no alcohol. Uh, basically, it, it, a lot of what I do is calorie counting. I live at a very minimal amount of calories a day. Um, I try to burn more than I put in through running, training, yoga, whatever I can do to, to burn calories and, and live in the 13 to 1500 calories per day. Uh, the easiest way to describe how I eat is a vegetarian that enjoys meat from time to time. So that's, uh, that's been the biggest thing for me. And being active, you know, yoga's done wonders. I think diet and yoga, those two together, have really kind of been the secret for what I can do. Yeah, you, you're a completely different person from when I saw you last week from prior to that. It's awesome. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. Uh, when, you, when you take it seriously and you start seeing the change, because I started at 360, which is, I mean, it's huge. And even today, I don't really see the same thing because I still have a pretty like bad skewed self image, but that's a whole thing of itself. So like from 360 to 290 when I at shot this year, you, you could tell a little bit, but it wasn't anything. But the difference from 290 to where I'm at today at like 240 is uh, that's where I've seen the most. And if you're an ultra competitive person, when you start seeing the scale, um, I'm sure it's not very healthy, but I check weight every day. 
Uh, I check it all in the morning and, you know, I, I try to see, you know, where I can go, what I can do. Originally I was like, I didn't think I'd ever hit 250. Now I'm like, I can do 200 and we'll, we'll see what it is from there. And the thing that really kicked all this off was uh, I wanted to learn how to skydive. So got to get down into a manager and then advanced free fall. And yeah, just, I have one goal and I've set out to accomplish it. And I've learned along the way that, you know, some fall downs and trip downs and I'm pretty rigid in what I eat and what I drink and consume. And because uh, if I fall off it, my body tells me immediately that it doesn't like it. Well, I remember at dinner, uh, you had someone, you had a bite of someone's dessert and you said immediately you could, you could feel it. Yeah. Uh, it was like key lime pie or something. I was like, ah, you know what? I'll, one little thing couldn't hurt. And I took like a little, a small, like half a portion of a normal spoon and I ate it and it sat there for like three or four minutes. And it was just, it was far too much sugar. Cause I spent the last 15 months, like no heavy carbs, no sugar, no alcohol. And like my, my body, I guess, is at the point where it doesn't handle that high amounts. And yeah, I couldn't imagine how bad it would be drinking soda. So yeah, it's uh you have to listen to what your body says when it you know when it likes and it doesn't like things that you consume and uh yeah you have to can you have to learn from that that's good stuff we had that conversation about sugar at nra last week adam and i did as i was standing there drinking a monster which i rarely do um but in fact you were standing there too uh but it you really notice i feel like a lot of people and adam i know that you felt this way and chris was talking about this earlier you know sugar is you don't realize how much of it is in so much of what's out there oh, yeah. and then how much yeah. it affects you once you cut it out um, just because of, you know, the, the food manufacturing, if you will, you don't, you don't realize and understand how your body turns and processes that and then just hangs on to it constantly. Yeah. Like we were, we were on the range all day today with a, a SWAT team here in Utah and, you know, I was drinking water, water all day. And then I was like, you know what? I'll have a Gatorade. And I drank, and it was one of the small, like, children's serving size. And I drank half of it. And I was like, I should probably look at the label. And it said 45 grand was, like, be bad. And probably 10, 15 minutes later, like, I was all jittery in the hands. I was just like, I, fuck, this sucks. Yep. My dad, I was with my dad and my mom last, or a couple weeks ago, we went out to a lake. My dad was drinking Powerade, and I was like, and he was literally just talking about how he was really proud of himself. He's eating healthy, cutting all that stuff. And I'm like, that's got to go. I was like, what? This is healthy. And I was like, no, no, it's not. Stop. Yeah, I mean, dumping sugary drinks and sodas and alcohol, I mean, I think that's probably going to be like the biggest thing for most people when they try to get healthy. I think it's probably one of the easiest weight fall off is cutting that overtly sugary stuff out of your life. Yep. Now, Chris, speaking of sugary things in your life. Yep. Let's go over what you went through. Okay. How, okay. First off, how and did focus you focus on the Twinkies <laughs> and focus on the Twinkies? Yes. They have a shelf life of a, of a thousand years. I uh, know. Um, so how did you find yourself going, gaining weight and then what were the habits that you that that caused you to form that, and then to go in the opposite direction? Okay, well, um, I guess just to you know, I have to start around uh, when I got off, out of the service. Well, when I was in the service to begin with, I was a really heavy, heavy drinker. I drank a lot every single day. You know, Wednesday night was ladies' night and fi fifty cent draft night, and all these different things here, this club, that club, the PX club, this all this stuff, and uh, you know. I did it. I did it right. And uh, over the years developed a habit, which parlayed from alcohol into heroin. And, um, you know, next thing I knew I was, uh, you know, $1,800 a week, um, you know, not eating for four or five days at a time, staying awake for six or seven days, but not that many, four to five days at a time. And then, you know, crashing for, for a couple of weeks, um, just really super unhealthy. And, uh, the whole time trying to live this rock and roll lifestyle and be this thing that people needed me to be or wanted me to be. And um, I needed the drugs and alcohol to, to become that and to, to remain that. And it got to the point where I was just trying not to be sick. And, and uh, it, it, so I was living a life of almost dying and not being sick. I was nothing but bad either way. And um, 
decided to get sober. And when I did, I went from, uh, I was like around 220, 240, or excuse me, around 215, 220 when I finally got sober, um, living off of chocolate milk and Twinkies, quite literally chocolate milk, Twinkies and ice cream. And, um, to eating real food and, uh, and not drinking anymore. And I gained, uh, I went up to almost 300 pounds, 287 is where I was. And I felt, um, uh, I didn't feel good about myself, uh, physically, mentally, everything was just, it was just terrible. And I, and I couldn't get to the bottom of it because when you quit drugs and alcohol to that degree, you're supposed to be happy. You're supposed to be uh, all the, you know, they, they tell you that it's going to be great. Things are going to be awesome, but it wasn't awesome for me. It was, uh, it was terrible and I couldn't, I, I was just on this other roller. I got off of one roller coaster ride onto another one and I had to do something about it. And uh, I was telling you guys before I watched the thing on Netflix called Forks Over Knives, which is a, uh, one of those, uh, you know, docu, docu, uh, docu horror film is what I like to call it. And they, they, uh, they scare you into vegetables and, and, and it, and it, it worked, man, did it work? I, I was telling you guys a minute ago, I went to my refrigerator and I cleaned out all the milk, all the cheese, everything made from an animal it was gone that night. My wife was totally on board. A hundred percent, um, uh, started losing weight almost immediately. And, uh, I was like, man, this is great. So I'm going to start running and, uh, being the addict, I got addicted to distance running. So the next thing you know, I'm 280 pounds trying to run 15 miles and, uh, you know, knees and feet, man, they just couldn't take it. I had to lose a bunch of weight, but, but I did, I ran a couple half marathons and, uh, uh, started barefoot running and um, doing all this crazy stuff, but I still couldn't get where I wanted to be. I, I, I had this vision of my body that I that I that I wanted to achieve, and I just thought that it was almost impossible to get muscles and uh, be in good shape and be healthy because I just didn't know how to do it. And uh, one day, man, I was I had some work uh, a crew at my house doing some work, and there's a guy on that crew every single day. He wore a different CrossFit shirt. And I'd never, I'd never heard of CrossFit. I didn't know what it was. I, you know, I was running, I was riding my bike. I was eating like, you know, I wasn't counting calories or, or anything like that at the time. I was just eating anything green that, that, that wasn't an animal and I was losing weight that way, but it can only go so far. You know what I mean? So I asked that guy what CrossFit was and he was like, man, he goes, I could spend five days explaining CrossFit to you. I just have to show you so tomorrow morning, eight o'clock, I'm going to come by. I'm going to get you. He was a, a, a level one trainer. He took me to his CrossFit box and he didn't kick my tail, man. He just basically explained, but while showing me what functional fitness was and what functional movement was. And I, and I, and I understood that almost immediately. I understood that it was going to help me become a better walker, a better sleeper, a better driver, a better shooter a better runner, a better bike rider, a better human being. I wasn't going to be slouching anymore. It was going to totally retune my whole body. And uh, dude, I, I went from obsessing about drugs and alcohol to obsessing about food to obsessing about CrossFit. And that's what I do, man. Five days a week, I do comp train three hours a day. And um, it's incredible. And, I, and I've also found a way to obsess about food inside CrossFit uh, because I've uh, started counting macros, which is... Um, which is a whole different animal. And, uh, and I've got a hundred percent control over my diet at the moment. So I'm really, I'm really excited about it. I'm down to about seven, maybe 8% body fat. And I've lost what, 100, 122 pounds altogether. Jeez. At what point did you realize that you were enjoying life again? Uh, almost immediately after starting CrossFit and, and just realizing that it wasn't that what only thing I was doing wrong in fitness was I, I wasn't paying attention to, how much of what I was putting in my body because I was still, I wasn't counting. Like I wasn't, I wasn't paying attention to carbs and fat and protein. I was just eating anything that was made from a vegetable. Twinkies don't have meat in them. Neither do Oreos. You know what I mean? So I was like, Oh, these are great. Cause these are vegan. And, and, and so I was just stockpiling all these different foods in my body that weren't necessarily uh, that good for me. I was um, eating chicken made of soy stuff and, you know, pro super, super, super processed weird stuff. And, you know, I was telling myself because someone else told me it was good for me that it was good for me. And it really wasn't. I was having issues with, di uh, um, you know, gastrointestinal issues and sore throats from soy and runny noses that I couldn't get in touch, that I couldn't get a handle on. And 
Um, I lost a bunch of weight. Yes, I did. And I probably saved a few trees in the process, but it did not work for me 100 percent, not 100 percent. So I ended up eating, uh, going back to eating meat. And uh, but now I'm starting to well, not starting. I'm 100 percent eating grass fed beef, farm raised chicken. Uh, I have chickens in my backyard for eggs. Don't drink milk at all. Like milk is you can just you can dump it down the drain as far as I'm concerned. And uh, and it's all about um, I control my weight with fat. I eat almost 3000 calories a day. I eat almost, uh, almost 400 grams of carbohydrates. Um, and but, you know, about 220 grams of protein and I only eat 70 grams of fat and that's where I control my weight right there. And I can go for days, man. I've got energy. Tell me those numbers again. Tell me those numbers again. <laughs> uh, right now I'm at, uh, I'm about 340, 340 grams of fat of, of carbohydrates on a rest day and about 390 on a training day, almost 400. Oh my God. I know. And I can't then, figure out how to do like 185. Well, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, if, if you, uh, I'm working Pardon. with a company called, uh, called working against gravity. And that's where I learned, yep. that's where I learned all this stuff about, about counting macros and man, it's incredible. I went, uh, I lost, I went to about from two, well, excuse me, 195 down to 165 in about 70 days. Good for you. That's awesome. I can tell you with absolute certainty, Oreos with peep centers are no good. So you're oh. not missing that. Oh, Oreos with right. dog crap centers would be good. That's pretty much what it is. That's yeah. pretty much what it is. <laughs> so Varg, in your position with training others, what have you found to be some of the biggest um, hurdles people have had to overcome? Uh, two, I, I narrowed it down to two main ones. Uh, uh, one is external, one is internal. Uh, the external one is, um, like he mentioned that he's, you know, he's five days a week, three hours a day, um, external factors for a lot of people will prohibit that kind of a schedule for, and I, and I know people are like, well, you got to do it, bro. Like, seriously, some people just cannot get that into their life. And you have to, mm -hmm. you have to try to try to overcome that as best as you can and in, in individual programming with them. Um, and the internal factor, the biggest one. Uh, is probably the there's a self-defeating there's a there's a series of self-defeating moments in in the fitness journey and i think everybody reaches those like uh in the beginning you know self-image and reward kind of kind of go hand in hand so when you go into the gym if you start to see a result uh and you 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 drop weight you start to feel like you look better that's a self-image related reward. Um, but when you start to plateau and you're not getting those anymore, then now we have this issue we have to overcome inside of ourselves to where, so you have to guide the person to kind of be like, Hey, uh, you know, this is, this is not something that, that we need to place that much value on, uh, you know, and, and start talking about different, uh, different things other than focusing on that self image versus immediate reward, uh, equation that everybody gets really caught up into it's easy when you first go into gym especially if they're dedicated because you see those first gains like super quick you know and if you eat if you eat right and you work out for a couple months like it's so fucking amazing how fast it happens right uh and then like after that that three to six month time uh that's when they really there's that that second set of hurdles they start to they hit that wall and it's like you know, am I doing anything? And, and it's, that's probably the biggest one. The schedule thing can be worked out. It can be worked out all the time. Um, but the internal one is the one that really takes the battle, I think. Cool. Yeah. To add to that, Varg, I see that a lot. And we talk about it a lot, coaching and working with people, you know, not even in the gym, but it's literally, you take this component of your self image, which is why you're in the gym in the first place, right? You're there, you're working hard, and it's it's where you are trying to be so successful, but it's also where you're emotionally vulnerable and physically vulnerable in that sense because you're trying to push yourself, but it's like every single person, no matter how tough, how good, how competitive, how strong, how dedicated they are, every single person that's there is emotionally vulnerable because they put this expectation of, here's what I'm going to do today and this is how I'm going to compete it or this is how I'm going to compete against myself. This is my goal. And then 
when they achieve it, they feel good. When you don't, you feel like a failure or you're putting this pressure on yourself to, you know, hit this standard every day. And mm. it's, it's the, I mean, bingo, it's a constant battle. Mm. Exactly. So where does sleep fall in all of this? Hmm. For duration, is there specific times? I know for me, my schedule kind of rotates working graves here and there and everywhere else. Sleep's actually pretty crucial to like the recovery cycle for me. Um, like, there's actually some pretty good studies on like uh, how sleep relates to training and the retention of knowledge. And I think your body understands that as well as your mind does. So like, I will generally have uh, better days in the gym if I get a solid minimum of six hours. Uh, so that's pretty much across the board. And you can also notice that you'll probably be mentally sharper. Uh, physically, you will be sharper. It's just your body has, you know, it's hit REM sleep and it's in that recharge mode. Um, there was actually a really good uh, Joe Rogan podcast on sleep and why it is so important. And if you don't hit REM sleep, your body will start banking those hours that you owe it and your overall physical performance will degrade every day that, you know, that you push past that you don't get good REM sleep. So for me, sleep, especially in the physical aspect of it is extremely important. Chris, how about for you? Yes, sir. Sleep. Um, I've never been a really good sleeper, so I, I feel like I come from the place where I have to I have to earn every hour I get. So, for instance, if I sleep in past uh, nine or ten o'clock in the morning, I will not be able to sleep that night, no matter how much physical activity I do. I can run a whole marathon, and I'll just be awake. So, my thing is to make uh, make waking up a priority. So I get up really early. I get up at five thirty every morning, so I can go to bed at night. When my head hits the pillow at nine. 915 I'm gone and that's how I do it and uh, I know that if my schedule I mean look for me I'm a, I'm a musician professional musician I, 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 I my hours are you know nine o'clock at night to hit the stage to 11 so on the road this is all out the window you know what I mean I have to kind of I got to kind of grin and bear it but when I'm home I'm semi-retired and I can live the life of an old person if I want to and uh, so that's what I do and that's how I get my sleep and uh I think Adam's right about uh, about the the sleep bank and and when I'm on the road and I'm trying to CrossFit like I do at home on the road, I can make it maybe six days. Then I gotta, uh, you know, I gotta I, I, things really start happening. You gotta be careful, man. I'm 47 years old. I I don't bend like I used to. And uh, next thing you know, I'm going getting dry needling and, and and got some dude trying to stretch my hammies out so I can get up and go, you know. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's it's a little tougher. So, man, sleep is really important and just trying to get it is, uh, is a priority for sure. Varg, you were going to say something? Yeah, I uh, – so the sleep thing, from, from my perspective on it, me personally, I have to sleep. I, I can't go – like I can do the six hours a night for a little while and it catches up with me, especially if I'm doing, uh, you know, six day a week, uh, um, five, six day a week workouts on my own, plus doing all the other stuff that I do, you know, mentally running the business and, and writing and recording and all the stuff that I'm working on. Uh, but individually people are all different. So the biggest thing that I think, as a coach, you know, or as a, as a trainer, realizing that, that the, the blanket answers are just not, they're, they're not available. Right. And so what works for each person on this panel is going to be very different. And, you know, I've heard people say that there's just no possible way for a person to function great on less than six or seven hours of sleep. Um, but then you get somebody like Jocko Willink, who's posting his times every morning when he's taking pictures of his watch and he's, you know, he's showing you how much time he's spending awake and the guy performs like a beast, right? Um, at on four and a half or five hours of sleep. So, uh, I think that it's, it's an individual thing that your, your, your nutrition intake, your, uh, activity level, your output and your, basically your reaction and your recovery, um, 
that's you have to figure that out on an individual basis like my answer or somebody else's answer or some system or methods answer is not going to be it's not going to be your answer you got to personalize it for yourself amy yeah you got to listen to your body i mean you it exactly what varg just said and what everybody else has said you got to listen to your body and you know people get stressed out they can't turn their brains off at night and sometimes that you know that's going to affect something it's not going to matter what i ate that day or what i did that day it could just be a number of other things and you know when you're not sleeping you're tired performance is going to be down whether that's in work or in fitness you know so you you got to listen to your body um that being said i'm a firm believer in the right nutrition and a you know getting my endorphins in, getting that workout in, even if it's not perfect, right? Perfect, what's perfect? Somebody define it. Just getting getting that movement in, getting my endorphins up, you know, fueling my body with the right nutritious things that it needs, I sleep better. And I, I think it's just a, a better, it puts me in a better mental state for who I am. Now we have a couple people on the panel who do live and Chris has brought it up and I already know Adam has to do this and I don't know about Amy, but I, and Varg does too, uh, incorporating travel and rotating shifts and maintaining this lifestyle. What are your guys' tips for this? What I'm thinking of are the cops that are, they're on a shift for two months, then they rotate to the next shift over. So they're, they're six to twos, 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. Now they're 2 p.m. to to 10 p.m. Now they're 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. And this shifts every few months. How do you maintain this lifestyle with this constant rotation? Or how do you maintain it with your travel? And this goes out to anyone. I mean, be nice to yourself. One, you got to be nice to yourself, right? Adam and I were having this conversation last week. Like, Adam was super diligent. Here he goes. He's going to go out and run. You know, I was talking about how I hadn't. And I try every time I try, but you got to be nice to yourself. You can't, you know, you're not perfect. And so if, if you can't follow your schedule, then, you know, that's okay. Don't consider it a failure, but pick up, you know, pick up where you left off as soon as you can. Yeah. I mean, for me, cause like right now I'm on another trip. I did Dallas and then now I'm in Utah. Um, for me, utilize your hotel gyms. Do, you know, work with what you have, make do. Um, running is a, is a great thing. I do a mile a day because it's, it's, and it's the first thing out. I'll do a mile because it gives me something that I can accomplish that set, you know, that sets me in the right mental headspace. Um, for guys that are on the road, it's going to come down to two things, flexibility and, and dedication, like dedication to continually do it regardless of where it is. Don't use a cop out of like, well, you know, I can eat like shit and not work out because I'm on the road and, you know, I just don't get anything good on the road. It's, it's, it's a complete fallacy and it's a lie. There are yoga studios that take walk-ins. There are CrossFit gyms that will accept walk-ins. There is, like I said, in this hotel, there's a first thing I do when I get in. After I get my card, I go make sure I figure out where the fitness center is. I'll look and see the traffic. And then I'm like, okay, cool. I got five o'clock plan that day. Um, if you just run out of time, like we do at SHOT Show, because you've got so many things going on, you either figure out how to allot it, or you need to understand that this time that I'm not going to do anything physical, whether it's a day, a week, a week and a half, you're going to pay for that some way, whether it is um, paying for it that you know, you're, you've got to figure out how to make that time up during that week, or you're going to have to work doubly as hard the next week to get caught up to where you were before you left. Um, for me, it's always trying to take a step forward and don't take any steps backwards. And if, you know, if I don't work out today, I probably need to pull two a day tomorrow just to catch up because I don't want to feel like I'm cheating myself because at the end of the day, this, you know, fitness isn't something you owe to anybody but yourself. Um, you could plenty of people, the heavy people very specifically, um, could, will live by the whole thing. Well, eventually something will change or somebody will help me nobody will it's like it comes down to you so if you can't maintain that dedication of continually improving yourself um you're just going to pay for it and you're going to pay for it by either pounds added on or you're going to fall back from where your current performance rate is 
You know, I think for me, uh, I, just to agree with Adam, Adam, I think that, you know, if you make fitness a priority in your life and you find a way to do it and you make the effort, I think the effort is the key word. And making the effort every day, you're going to find a way to do it. You're definitely going to find a way to do it. And there's going to be obviously days that you can't do it, but you got to live. I think for me, I live the kind of like the 80, 20 kind of lifestyle. So if I can, if I can force 80% of the time, really work out hard on the days that I know I can make it work, then there's those 20% days where I maybe don't feel as good, or maybe I can't find a CrossFit gym that can take me at a certain time or whatever. I can, I can still get my endorphins up by doing a workout. Maybe not the one I want to do, but if I make fitness priority, I'm going to do something just by default. And, uh, and I really, I really love that. And it almost becomes a, it becomes a mindset and a lifestyle after a while. The next thing you know, it just becomes what you do. You know, you that's just what you do. And it's not, there's not a question about it. And, uh, and that's, that's where I'm at. And I, and I really like what Adam said about that. It's really awesome. Yeah. I mean, running push-ups and sit-ups are cheap. Yeah. So they're you, free. Can, you can, you can do them anywhere. They yeah. require minimal space and, Doing anything is better than doing nothing. Like, even if it's just running a quarter mile, you know, running quarter mile sprints. Like, I'm on this big kick now of running in the things I carry. So, like, when I get home, I'll get out of my car with gun, keys, everything on me, and I'll set my timer and I'll run a quarter mile. And then I'll run a quarter mile back and I'll do it two more times. And that gave me a mile, but I only used a quarter mile track. Um, same thing with push ups. Like, you can. You can push earth any time of the day, anywhere. I mean, it's not a, you know, a spatially, uh, you know, usable thing. Like it, it, you can do it in a fucking, you know, five by five area. Yep. Sure can. Do you ever do that drill where you have everything and go swimming? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. no, at least not intentionally. <sighs> no. One of the, for travel, one of the things that I use, I, I happen to have one sitting right here. Uh, I will carry these. I'll throw one of these in my in my baggage or in my car or whatever. This is a Slastic Pro Band, and it's a dual band, and you can hook it. Like if I can catch a pool door with the and put the frame on the inside for me, so when it when you pull on it, it's pulling against the entire frame. You don't rip door handles off. Like or go outside, wrap it around a tree. Um, those are what I use to do my everyday warm up in the morning. That's my first 20 minutes of the day is I have a series of those outside on the, on the farm here and I just hit those hard. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and you can take those literally like, like the ones like this with the single strap, you can take that anywhere and hook that anywhere. Like, and it's just, it takes up very little room in your bag. I mean, it's just, there's, you know, you can definitely carry and, and I will take one of these and, and I challenge anybody I will kick your ass in 20 minutes with one of these. Like you'll be, you'll be cooked, you know, so you can get a, a complete functional full body workout with that thing. And it's, it's not a problem. Well, you don't need hours a day to work out. And I think that's a big misconception. I think that's the biggest misconception about kind of fitness and nutrition, which when they're combined, right, they're working simultaneously together. And, you know, like Chris said, when Chris is on tour, right? You're on your feet. You're, you're on your mental game is in an adrenaline high endorphin mode. Right. And then you're also trying to find this time to work out and keep making it happen. You know, Adam, when you're at shows, you're traveling, you're, you're running and moving. You're constantly on it. Be nice to yourself, you know, do, do your thing. Be nice to yourself. But you also don't, but you also don't have to spend an hour or two in the gym. No, get your body moving. Work those muscles. It's so good for you. I think that's why I can't sit down. Whom, Adam? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Adam's very impatient right now. Yeah. I was no. like, I got to go work out. We're talking about it. Oh, no. Like, I, we were, we ran three miles today, which was fun, but I'm, uh, I had to run back to the hotel to grab a, uh, night vision because we're going to go shoot out to about a thousand meters under nods tonight nice i'll just be at my house <laughs> one of the things that like nobody ever talk talks about is like the uh how scary it is to take that first step into this like i i know when i first got into this like the scariest thing for me was going to the gym and feeling people stare at me and be like, look at the fat man working out. 
Um, I don't know if that's just me or where I've worked out, but man, um, the stigma of being a heavy set person trying to get fit is fucking terrifying. We hear it in the gym a lot. I hear it in the gym a lot. And literally it becomes one of the reasons that they don't want to work out. Actually yesterday during a workout, one of, one of the gals, literally she was crying as she was finishing the workout. She started crying and she's like, I'm so mad at myself yet in that moment, she's mad at herself because she didn't have her nutrition where she felt like her nutrition should be yet. She crushed this goal and a seven year time lapse of something that she hadn't done for seven years four kids later, mm. you know, so me, I'm going, that's amazing. Like give yourself a high five. Right. But it, you're right. And it's, but it's that self image thing. And it's that, it's that, well, I can't do it or I'll do it later. Or people are looking at me and it's like, you're just, you're in people, not you, the majority of you, if you will, are in such a vulnerable state in that moment of doing something for themselves that they're so, you know, everybody is so vulnerable to treating themselves poorly. Now, what exactly do you mean by that? By treating yourself okay? It's it's not Twinkies. We've established that. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, I mean, just being so hard on yourself, right? Tear, tearing yourself apart and either tearing yourself apart and saying you can't do something or or going, you know, I just don't want to do this anymore and I'm just going to sit and eat a pizza. I'll start tomorrow. Right. Or, you know, well, I can't do this. this. I'll be the horrible pizza. person. Hey, I like pizza too, but you know, there's balance, right? So, so finding that balance of motivating yourself to go, here's where I'm at and I'm going to take control of me and I'm going to move forward. Right. And you know, some of the things Chris was talking about earlier of, the macros, and you know, Varg knows this too, is your macros. Adam's talking about extreme calorie, you know, de deficiencies. Um, there, there are a lot of extreme things that you can follow, and there's this level of commitment. And and somebody looking at it from the outside that wants to start tomorrow is going, God, that's hard. I don't like. I'm not in the right mental state. You know what Adam, what Adam and Chris talked about, of where they are at. Like this is so hard. I don't want to do this. And then they go. You're talking about macros. What the hell are macros? <laughs> how am I supposed to? How am I supposed to count this? This is stupid. I don't want to do this. I don't. I just want to eat. I just want to eat, and not worry, right? And it becomes this this entire puzzle of well, I got to put this together, and I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do that. And and for me, you know, as a coach, as somebody who's helped people, even you know, outside of my gym, just from a straight nutrition, it's like go to the grocery store and just start shopping the outside lanes. Don't shop anything that's processed. And, you know, vegetables. Veg vegetables are intimidating. They're, Chris said it. He's like, oh, my God, vegetables, right? But they're delicious. <laughs> yeah, they are good. But you can also buy them in frozen packages in the freezer section. And is that the best? Maybe not. But is it a starting point? Absolutely. Right? And so, you know, Chris, you're talking about how you're going to, you know, you're shooting your own food and you went complete grass fed and all this stuff like that. If you go tell somebody who's looking to start this tomorrow, they're like cost, time, all the different places, right? Th these become the excuses. Yep. But if you, when you dial it back and you go, okay, what is it, you know, people looking at themselves, like what I say is, okay, what is it that you want to achieve and where can you start? right? Get, get moving. I don't care what you do. Get moving. And two, change your nutrition yep. and start shopping from the outside, right? Eat protein, vegetables, eat carbs, but quit eating Cheetos for your carbs, right? Cut out, cut out soda, cut out all those processed sugars and just start somewhere. Like if the veggie steamer bags are what work for you, then do it. Like it's a starting point because what happens in you know, Adam and I were talking about this last week. Like, you've already seen this change in Adam. For those of you that don't know Adam, like, this shift in Adam from even, you know, last shot show to now is incredible mentally, but also his commitment. And Chris, obviously, you know, you're deeper in the process, but you're talking about the extreme levels you hit. You know, in your book, you're, you're discussing all the different 
things that people can do. And it's just find a starting point, commit to it, and then slowly add. I think that that is more sustainable for people long term. Um, and, and some people can't do the cold turkey thing. So, you know, pick something and run with it and just be nice to yourself. Yeah, that's good. The advice. one thing that really, the one thing that really stuck it for me, uh, somebody jokingly said, you can't outrun a bad diet. Uh -uh. Like, no matter how hard you work, sure. you, know, you, you can never outrun or outwork a bad diet. Um, yep. I, the, the hardest thing is, is truly correcting the absolute garbage that we as a civilized world consume, you know, convenience food, you know, take the time, cook the thing, spend it with your family or your friends. You know, like single ingredient nutrition is huge. You know, not only better, but it's better for you. And, uh, and, and like I said, the taking the time to actually prepare it. I mean, easily, you know, something as simple as making a spinach salad. Mm -hmm. or in the work week just because it's quick and I know what I'm putting into it every day. Um, when you're on the road, that's right? You can I buy the grilled chicken. Day, you know? Oh, I, I, got, I went to Walmart. As soon as I got into Utah, I went to Walmart and I bought all the same stuff that I buy at the grocery store at home. And I right. stuck it in my fridge and it doesn't take up a lot of room and it, you know, I can eat the same 1,340 calories I eat every single day to maintain where I'm going and what I'm doing. Um, but yeah, if you can commit, if you can get on a diet that works and what works for me absolutely will not work for anybody else. It may, but I can't promise that it does because everybody's body is different. They work different. We're different ages. We have different builds. So like my already is great every day, but it may not be what works for Chris. You know, he needs plus calories a day. Um, but when you finally figure out that like magic ratio, you stick to it. And like fixing your your nutrition, hands down, is, is the most important step in the journey. And then to touch back on what Varg said, which is really important, um, is don't let the plateaus freak you out. Um, I was dropping a lot of weight really quickly with you know with everything I was doing, and then I hit 260 and it stopped. And I could, I was doing everything I could, listening to like people that were like, oh man, you should start eating more, you know, because you're burning more and, and, and all this stuff. And I just was like, I couldn't figure it out. And I was like, you know what? I, I'm just going to stick with what works. Maybe like right now, my body's just like, Hey, you know, let's, let's give yourself another test. Let's see if you can actually stick with it when I don't want to do what you want me to do. And I, I, you know, I stayed at 260 for almost a month and a half. And then it, it started coming back off again. And, you know, I, not getting, being able to get past those plateaus is another big thing. But I just wanted to make sure because Bart said it earlier, and that was really important. I wanted to touch back around on it. Hey guys, uh, I hate to do it. It's such a great panel, but I have to go. And uh, well, thanks uh, for joining us. Yeah, man, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. This has been really good. One. Nice to meet everybody. And, uh, nice to nice meet you, Chris. Great, great advice, man. Thank you, guys. Thank you. See you. I'd like to add something to that discussion that's going on right now. Um, can you guys hear me? Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the, the other thing that I would like to caution people about is it, in the vein of what we're talking about, the intimidation factor and the, and the quit factors, right? Like um, the standard that you, the standard that you try to set for yourself. And this is especially, let me, let me speak directly to, my A type training guys that want to be badasses, right? Like you're especially guilty of this. You look at the most baddest ass person in the thing that you're trying to do and you want to be like them, right? And so you're setting your standard right off the bat to be like this person who is more than likely a professional athlete that lives a professional athlete's lifestyle uh, and, and, and your your lifestyle is not that lifestyle, and um, and also you don't understand what's going on there either. Um, I'm not a CrossFitter. Uh, I'm a you know I'm I'm more combat conditioning and uh, traditional Olympic lifting. I'm I'm a big traditional Ollie guy. So um, going back way way back to high school before you know the, the 
junior high school years before CrossFit was ever conceived. And like I credit them with bringing Olympic lifting back into the spotlight. I'm very happy that happened because it was like nearly lost. But, but anyway, the, the, when you look at these guys that are like, say the CrossFit, uh, they'll look at somebody like Rich Froning and he's like supposedly working like all like, you know, six workouts a day and all this crazy shit. And, and he's, you know, um, and what you don't realize the behind the scenes sometimes is that, um, you know, there's times where, you know, he's going to the bar and he's hitting 40 or 50 percent for a workout. Um, and, and this is like a meditative practice. Like it's it's a form practice thing. Like so if I can go and I'm doing three a day workouts, right? There's times I'll do three a day. Like I'll do my, my warm ups, my in the bag work in the morning, come back and do a, a full Ollie program. And then I'll go to the gym at night or something. Um, there might be a day where I feel extra good and I'm going to go and I'm going to do, I'm, gonna, I, I, I'm like, I'm feeling some snatches. So I'm going to go do some snatch work, but I'm doing like 50%. And so I'm not taxing myself. What I'm actually doing is I'm just, I'm psychologically pleasing myself by 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 doing the work, but I'm I'm it's a zen like practice of the form. Like you're you're putting in the work at a at a lower weight. You're not taxing yourself. You're but you're keeping touch with it. So the point is is that sometimes you're looking at someone who's like doing this massive amount of stuff, and they're saying we work out four hours a day and stuff. Like two hours of that might be like zen type, you know, just just forty fifty percent work, and 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 a lot of that stuff is you know is hype uh and 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 when you're watching people on instagram or you're you're reading about their stories and stuff like that um if you're the if you're the greatest greatest athlete in the world right um you know you're gonna sound like the greatest athlete in the world so if you're listening to someone like that to set your standard right you you're you're just you're just shooting for the wrong target and and you need to take a look at realistically the the long term the long term commitment that it takes to get there and not be intimidated by that but find joy in the process find find that zen practice within the process that you just like doing the form you like doing the movement um and it doesn't always have to be you know four plates on the bar and fucking like everything's got to be ready for instagram like everything you do doesn't have to be on instagram <laughs> but if it's not online it's not real right (laughs) right well yeah touching on that like the reason i put stuff on instagram especially my fitness stuff is because i was fat forever and i took hardly any pictures of myself so now like for me it's 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 not so much like to show like how good i'm doing it's basically like my journal of like that i can look back and look at my journey in one kind of centralized location and speaking to what Varg said about trying to set like I want to be like this person I think is complete bullshit I think setting like attainable goals like mine is hey man I want to jump out of a fucking airplane so what do I got to do to jump out of an airplane like that I think is a you know setting like those kind of goals instead of being like I want to be like such and such because I'm never going to be you know I'm never going to be a an operator i'm never going to be a professional football player like i just it's not me so like what you said why set yourself up on the you know right out of the gate to fail but for you adam you're also motivating people like you're not you're not sitting there talking you know i think what varg is talking about and not to put words in your mouth Varg, but basically like you're holding yourself accountable. That's part of your accountability race, right? That's what you're doing. But you're also motivating people. And there are there are a lot of, you know, yeah, social media is great. It's awesome. But, you know, some of those things that you're posting are, are good. And it's good to encourage people to do fitness, even if it's basic. Um, Varga hates snatches, but I still do them. Um, you know, but there are there are different things that you do and you want to do and you want to get out there and do, and it's okay to document that. It's okay to try to engage people to get involved and get active. And that's positive, but you know, exactly what Varg is saying is, you know, these people, the Brookenses, the Brook Wells, the Matt Frazier's, the Rich Fronings, these people are getting paid 
to do fitness. They have nutritionists that are bringing them food, right? They have free physical therapy. I mean, if you're gunning and running and you're doing a lot of Fully lifting and all that stuff like you better also be getting some work some mobility work and taking the time because <laughs> your spine and your muscles are not gonna be you know compacted enough to to get through that if you're not taking care of your body too um, so uh, social media is great but I agree with Varg it also drives a lot of comparison of well how am I supposed to be like this or I want to be like this, or I always want to look cut. And, you know, really that cut picture is from somebody who just got done working out, has been starving their body of, you know, water to, to get that, you know, complete cut muscle structure. That's not what people look like all day long, every day. No, that's, no, that's the other, that's the other part of it too, is that some of that, especially in the bodybuilding world, if you got behind the actual nutrition of those guys, because I, I worked, especially when I was exposed to it in uh, West Palm, when I worked West Palm beach as a trainer, the, the gear, you know, the, the, the drug use and the, and the horrible, horrible nutrition, like damaging, destructive nutrition to, to reach physique show levels, right? Yeah. Like terribly yeah. Stripping destructive. your body of complete water. Yeah. Terrible stuff. Like, Unbel like this is why they die when they're 50 of kidney failure yep. and shit heart and failure. heart attacks and yeah. all that stuff it's it's unbelievable like you can't you can't look at somebody like that and be not that everybody that's got a physique like that does that but you know you don't know um and and it's just uh and also the social media thing drives it drives people to push themselves a little too hard because they're they're more concerned about showing how much weight they can pull like right now Thank deadlift is the hot is the hot kicks right deadlift is the i don't know where it came from but all of a sudden the last six months everybody's got a deadlift and everybody's got to hit over 400 right so it's like every time somebody goes in the gym now it's like set the phone down and let me see if i can pull four plates and you know and really uh there's there's a lot of bad form there's a lot of bad stuff going on that if you just back down to 60 percent of what you're pulling and and you know meditatively practice that form your, your overall fitness is going to get a lot better and you could reach those higher levels of strength with more longevity because I think the way that I see people pushing it because they want to show it so much, they're pushing it, they're shortcutting it. And uh, I think there's going to be long-term problems. It happens. You're guilty. I was so mad at Ernest. Actually, he posted, he posted a video from a competition of a one rep max of a deadlift and I was like, my form was terrible. Why did you post that? Don't put that out there. It was horrible, <laughs> right? And two pounds yeah. lighter, literally two and a half pounds lighter than that was perfect. Perfect, yeah. But then you get to this point because you're in this competition, right? And I'm like, I gotta do it. Yeah. And thankfully I didn't hurt myself, but you see people hurting themselves all the time. And you know, I hurt myself enough that it, it forced me to, to really dial back, you know, personally of like, you know what, I'm not gonna be, a competitor like I want to look good naked I want to be in shape and I'm um, I want to grow strength but who am I trying to prove something to nobody myself like I just want to work out be myself and I think you know coming to that especially after starting CrossFit um, was was the hard part and then obviously once I started you know coaching more and being more engaged it it became easier because I've been a coach for 15 years. I've been coaching CrossFit and, and fitness for the last couple of years. And it just makes, you know, you see things through a different set of eyes because you're watching, you're watching the whole picture of people, their mental state, their form, what they want to do, where they want to go, their goals. And, and I, I don't know, from the outside looking in, it just put a different perspective on it for me. So one thing for, for me is uh, I've kind of, at least, at least for again for myself is that I can't try to lift and cut weight at the same time. It just doesn't work, and I don't know if that's a universal rule, but for me, like the only strength training I do is to maintain like current level. Like I'm not looking to get stronger. Everything for me is 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 cutting weight. You know, getting to a point of like 200 pounds, then I can work on strength. And 
I, again, I don't know if that's a, a universal approach, if that works for everybody, if that's just me. But I know that if I try to push at the gym and I try a month of just, you know, trying to continually, you know, get stronger and get better, like I wasn't seeing anything change on the scales. And that was like almost devastating to me. And then I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go back to what works of, you know, eating right, running and doing yoga. And, uh, yeah, I, I, that, that's just a question is, I don't know if that's a, is that a rule of thumb or is that very much a me thing that you can't get strong and lose weight at the same time? Hmm. Amy, you got something for that? I Definitely think not be me. that, yeah, no, I think that there. I don't know that I would say that it's universal. I think that there is a lot of, um, there's a lot of power in when you are really heavy to dropping weight, right? You, it, it's going to be easier for you to, to drop the weight and, and kind of pick up on that cardio piece when, you know, when you are really heavy. That being said, there's a lot of power in muscle building. Um, you know, muscle eats fat. And when you're, when you're lifting, that's going to go faster. Um, so I think, I think there is a balance. I know that, you know, when, when I'm working with heavier clients, it's focusing on nutrition one, and then more cardio, high rep, you know, lower weight to, to get down but still working on that form, that function, and a little bit of that muscle building. I think that that muscle building, you know, won't change the scale, but it's going to change your inches. Like people are surprised when I tell them how much I actually weigh. Um, and it's equated, you know, more to muscle than, than anything else. And I'm, I'm Adam and somebody who doesn't get on the scale every day because I'd go crazy. So, so the, the, so the, 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 the engine burns the fuel and there's two ways to, uh, uh, two ways to modify that. You can make the engine bigger or you can just put less fuel in. But so Adam takes the calorie deficit approach. Um, and, and the, like, if you, if you try to start to build muscle at the same time as you're, as you're cutting extreme like that, uh, you, you're going to have a hard time. You can't, the extreme part is the problem. Like you can't get into having a, a massive goal of cutting weight like that and increasing muscle mass at the same time. Nutritionally, I don't know how you could work your that body. Out. You'll hang on to the fat because you're yeah. not giving it enough fuel. Yeah. And, and so it's, I mean, it's calories in and calories out at the end of the day. Um, but to understand that, that muscle builds the, um, it, well, building muscle is is the is the the metabolism, right? That's what burns fat. That's what burns calories. That's what that's that's what uses the fuel, fuel you put in uh, your brain and your muscles. Like so, if you increase your muscle mass, you're you're increasing your body's capability to to burn those carbs and and um, you know fats and all that stuff. But so so I've always been a big proponent of. If I get a client who's who wants to lose weight, I really want to see you build uh, a strong, um, you know, strong muscular base, right? And because too many people don't want to do that, they just want to do cardio, cardio, cardio. And uh, I just really caution against that because I really think that it's super important to have that metabolism to be strong, not just work off of a calorie deficit, but build a healthy metabolism based on a, a higher uh, muscle you know a higher muscle density uh and more muscle mass in the body and, and rather than just focusing on cutting weight you know adding muscle mass is is important i think and i'm a big huge proponent of cycles like you have to do cycles you can't just like go extreme on one thing forever so it's okay like if you reach 240 and then you go on a building phase where you get up to 265 and then cut back down. When you cut again, you're going to find out it's very, very different because you, if you kept your nutrition right and you went into a bodybuilding phase for six weeks or eight weeks or whatever, you could be, you know, 
uh, uh, that much better when you come back off of that. And uh, I just really, you know, I just don't think you should think about sticking in one thing for a long time. And, and a muscle building phase, I think, is is really is prerequisite to having an overall healthy metabolism. And on that same topic, and, you know, Caitlin just joined us, and she's obviously high on nutrition, feed the machine nutrition. She runs her own business. But on that topic, and I was literally going to ask you this, Varg, before you went into it, is, you know, what are your thoughts on people that, you know, you're calling it cycling, but that that cha change your pattern, right? You can get into to lifting, right? You get people that just want to lift. They just want to do that. Um, like, I love the CrossFit striking. We got a bag. You know, I do, I do some of that as well, like change up your workouts and do them different. And as much as you got to change up your workouts to be different in your body, you got to change up your eating so that you're putting different things in your body and, and fluctuating. I mean, I don't know, I guess I'm asking and Caitlin, a prime time to join. Um, we probably need an intro too, before she starts that fluctuation of, of eating. Hey guys, I gotta get out of here. I gotta start getting set up for tonight. You're you're gonna go running, aren't you? Uh, no, I already ran two miles today. I'm good. Okay. All right, Adam. Bye, Adam. Later, Thanks for joining Bye, us. Guys. See ya. All right. So is that for is that for Caitlin then, or is well, that probably for you guys? But let's if we wanna Matt, do you wanna have Caitlin yes. intro herself? I think that would be a good idea. Take it away, Hi, Caitlin. You, oh, okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Caitlin Bauer. Um, I operate a nutrition coaching business called Feed the Machine Nutrition. I specialize mostly in macro nutrition coaching. Everything I do is remote, so I talk on the phone or email with my clients. And I have a variety of different clients. I personally do competitive CrossFit, so I have several CrossFit clients who anything from, you know, just the weekend warriors to people who just want to lose a couple pounds to high-level competitors. So my, I'm all about finding a balance that works for you, something that's sustain, sustainable. Um, everything I do is completely customizable. Uh, completely personal, based on diet history, age, activity level, you name it. So that's a little bit about what I do, and I've uh, been certified for that, as well as additional education on hormones and nutrition, on the psychological part of working with people and their nutrition, uh, which cannot be underrated. So, Cool. And I don't think, we haven't really talked that much about nutrition other than Twinkies and chocolate milk, so... Oh, that's the best kind. Yeah, you miss Chris. He talked about his favorite foods. <laughs> Love it. So, Amy, do you want to reframe your question? Well, no, just back, yeah, back to the topic of, you know, eating and cycling. Um, I think that was the term that you used is of cycling, nutrition, you know, and workouts, like how do you, do you do that personally? Mm -hmm. And with your clients, do you do that? And how do you see it? Like I do it. I'm big, I'm a big proponent of it. And, you know, Caitlin, I'm sure you are as well. Yeah. I, I personally do it. Uh, I like to, uh, like I'm, I will get stuck on ollie lifting. If I just did not, if I just did what I wanted to do, I would just ollie lift all the time. And then I would have, you know, these deficits and imbalances that would be in it begin to form from just sticking in this one track. Uh, and so you so, snatches all day, right? Yeah, I would, snatches. I would Snatch all day. <laughs> it's, uh, <sighs> I don't care if I get down to like a bare bar, I still want to keep going, you know, like, so, um, and it's that pursuit of that perfect form. That's what drives it's that form, right? It's not just throwing the weight up. It's like, did this one feel good? Did this one feel the way it should have felt? Like, um, but for me, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of pushing cycles, not just in different type of, of workout. Like guys will be like, well, I used to do arms on Tuesday and now I do it on Thursday. You know, like, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like, uh, will, will a CrossFitter 
benefit from going on a six or eight week powerlifting cycle? Yeah. You know, would, uh, would a bodybuilder benefit from going on a, a six week golly lifting cycle? Yes. Like, you know, this, this getting out and getting into different, different planes of motion, different workouts, different, uh, you know, attacking the body from different angles and, you know, burning the engine in different ways, basically. And what you're trying to do is just to, uh, you know, avoid overuse and avoid, you know, pushing yourself into plateaus that, that are hard to get out of. And also basically getting yourself a, a seeking balance, right? So if you're like people who are constantly pulling in one plane of motion, like you get power lifters, they're constantly pulling or pushing in one single plane of motion. And the minute that they step out of that and, and have to twist or turn or do something that's in, in a, across different planes of motion and in the joints, the antagonist and the synergist muscles, like all the little musculature and things that are involved in, in moving that, uh, that joint across planes of motion immediately begin to be overtaxed by those gigantic muscles that are overdeveloped in that one single plane of motion. So cycling to me, like avoids stuff like that. And it also yep. avoids plateaus and things like that. So yes, on both, I do it for clients and I do it for myself personally. If you guys have something further, go ahead because I have something that I've been waiting to ask, but okay, then I'll ask. <laughs> okay, so Varg, we had a conversation yesterday talking about uh, more functional fitness and how much more beneficial that is than going to a specific type of fighting art for for your for your fitness. Do you think you can can go over that a bit? Um, so I deal a lot with self defense, and uh, it, my prim my primary business is self defense training, and. I'm now going moving more percentage wise into fitness again, because I, I do miss it. I miss the positive aspects of fitness as opposed to the negative aspects of gunfighting and, and killing and maiming people all the time. So um, with that in mind, the type of the type of philosophy that I use for training is conditioning is where everything is developed at. So you cannot take, isolated skill training and develop yourself into a fluid or dynamic fighter based on isolated skill drills and, and katas for lack of a better term. Um, naturally occurring technique happens when, when your body begins to understand proprioception and deceleration. Um, it's like, it's like when you go on the range and you see people who have never had a martial arts or physical labor background, have never done any sports, played soccer, nothing. They're super awkward when they're changing levels or changing positions and you can see it and you're like, this person does not understand how to move their body, right? Like they don't understand where their body's at in space and how to put it in the next position, right? They're just literally lost. And and then you get somebody who has like fought or wrestled or played soccer and you get them on the range and they're like changing levels and they understand like how to take their body from here to here and move to get there in an efficient way. And so when I got guys coming to me that are like, well, I'd like to fight better in the clinch. And I'm like, do you, do you understand what it's like to be pushed or pulled? You know? And so I start with like a simple push pull drill and guys are like, oh, man, this is – and I'm like, you're just pushing and pulling on each other, and you just blew your mind. What you need to do is get in the gym and do some functional training. Like, I don't care if you do CrossFit or you go to a boxing gym or you do something that you're moving across all the planes of motion and you're, and you're doing unpredictable things so that you can begin to just basically understand how your body moves and how to put it into a position. It's that proprioceptive awareness that people develop through conditioning. Um and so, bottom line, you cannot be a good fighter if you don't have that conditioning level. And not only having had it, but you need to maintain it and get or get it back if you had it before and lost it. So, my philosophy is based on, you know, conditioning is what builds a great fighter. And conditioning is what builds abilities like uh, naturally occurring techniques and understanding where to put your body um, acceleration and deceleration, especially deceleration for me is a big one. Um, Olympic lifting teaches a lot of that, like 
you know, knowing where to stop that bar and how to, how to fire those antagonist muscles to make sure that that bar stops where it needs to. So you can balance that weight where it needs to be like that takes a proprioceptive awareness and, and a, and a ability to decelerate and, and precisely stop uh, that you just don't develop it just by, I stand there and say, okay, this is how you do this. And then you do it right. Like you got to go and throw that bar and drop it a bunch of like a bunch of times before you start to understand, like, how your body needs to feel where it needs to be. And, and, and that comes through conditioning. So that's why, that's why I push the conditioning thing, especially with the self-defense angle, because you don't have proprioception. You don't have like that awareness about these things about your body without putting that time in. Yeah. We... And on, I mean, Along with that and conditioning, like I almost now that Caitlin's on, and Caitlin earlier we were talking to um, Adam Penny and Chris who were on. They were, you know, very heavy. Both followed extreme nutrition, we call nutrition plans. Um, you know, as a nutritionist, my question to you, um, and as a coach, is, you know, what do you what do you tell people that are going? You know, what I need to get my ass in shape. I need to get my you know what together how, you know, not going to the extreme of making the puzzle piece, you know, crazy to put together with macros and everything. How do you, how do you advise people to start? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So a lot of people get to a point where, and this is one thing that I tell people, I say, you need to be in a position in life uh, your current circumstance where you're ready to commit to this. So mm -hmm. people going through a job change, a move, a lot of family stress or drama, things like that are going to take focus away from nutrition. And for nutri and, and typically for people making a nutritional change is really consuming at first it's also going to require it to make it a priority. So that's what I tell people. I say, are you in a position to make this a priority? And if the answer is yes, then I'm very big on education drives compliance. Okay, so people are going to be more willing to comply with what I'm asking them to do if they know why they're doing it. And I think that goes for a lot of things. But... So I have someone come to me, hey, I, and typically people are at that point where they're ready to commit when they come to me. Um, I'm not cheap, <laughs> and mm -hmm. it is a big time commitment. So when they come to me and I take an intake and I ask them a lot of questions about their lifestyle, I ask them a lot of questions about their diet history, uh, what has worked for them, what hasn't. Why hasn't it worked? What do you perceive to be um, either mental or physical roadblocks for you in achieving success? What are your goals? That's probably the biggest thing we talk about, or what are your goals? Okay, we have to make sure it's something realistic. So I know a lot of people are like, well, I want to snatch 300 pounds but be super shredded. Okay, well, we talk about... Varg likes um, snatching, by the way. Just so you know, that? he loves... Varg oh, loves yeah, snatches. I, I caught that. That's awesome. <laughs> well, and then how many people do you know that can snatch 300 pounds that are totally shredded? Not really. Okay, yeah, exactly. so we talk a lot about this um, pyram pyramid of awareness I talk about. Okay, so we have uh, health, we have performance, we have um, aesthetics. Okay, and it's very unlikely, not possible really, to have all three. Okay, and whether whatever you choose to focus on means it's going some of one of the other two are going to lack a little bit. Okay, so if you're for, focusing on performance and performance athletes, depending on what sport you're doing, you know, will yield a certain aesthetic. Um, but aesthetics are not our priority. So I have a lot of CrossFit people that like, I want to perform, but I also want to be shredded. I'm like, well, you got to pick one or the other because that requires different fueling. Okay. Different approach, different mindset. Um, people who are health, I just want to live healthy for longevity. You you know, I'll name like the top CrossFit athlete 
Matt Frazier, okay? People who, who aren't aware of who that is, um, he's won the CrossFit Games two years in a row, fittest man on earth, okay? I guarantee you his focus right now is not on longevity, okay? His focus is up purely on performance, okay? So we are going to fuel and attack that differently than we would someone looking for a six-pack, okay? Someone looking um, just to be healthy with amazing biomarkers, okay? So a lot... So back to your question on, you know, what do I, how do I approach people that kind of come to me the first time is a big kind of reality check. Here's the reality of the situation. Here's what you're telling me your goals are. Okay. And we clarify, make sure we're both on the same page. What does that mean? What is it going to take to get there? Okay. And um, probably communication is the biggest thing. It's a lot of, you know, it's, what I love about this job is it's way more than nutrition, I've found out. A lot of it's almost life coaching um, because people's attitudes and mindset around nutrition, around food, around body image, around the, the number on the scale is, is huge. And some of it's very deep-seated. Some of it's been things they've been thinking for years. So I have to really navigate those waters carefully um, and really get them to buy in and to trust me, you know, and if, if I don't know the answer, I'll, I'll find it out. I don't claim to be an expert, but, uh, I love the people aspect. So hopefully that kind of in a long way <laughs> answers your question. No, I think you're right. And we talked about, um, the whole body image and the mental, you know, the mental game, like in the gym, nutrition, all that stuff. People are coming into, you know, Varg runs a gym in Florida. Um, you know, you, people that are coming into the gym and when they work out, no matter where they are, they're in such a vulnerable mental state mm -hmm. because it is, you know, d despite what you want to say or where it is, whether they're being competitive, whether they're they're good, they're in shape or they're not in shape, right? Everybody's walking in with this expectation of themselves and what they're going to do that day, right? And they're gauging their success for the day or their their opinion of themselves on how did I complete this task today or what did I do or, oh, that, that workout? Yeah, I'm going to do this. And, you know, oh, my back hurt, so I couldn't do it or... I just wasn't feeling it or I'm super dehydrated, right? We, you know, there's so many factors that play into it. And you're talking about the mental game. You know, we, we haven't even talked about stress and cortisol and the effect that has on your body. Oh yeah. You know, affecting everything from holding on to those nutritional pieces in your body and affecting your sleep and now affecting your workout, right? Like it's yep. all connected. Mm -hmm. Big time. I think it was an important point that you brought up uh, and I coach people on this too, that, that these, these athletes who are pushing for the highest levels of performance are sacrificing longevity, right there. They are definitely 100% sacrificing longevity. And we talked about it earlier where people are, you know, new people coming into it are fixated on these guys and their performance levels and they want to be like that. And they don't understand yet that, you know, number one, that lifestyle is not your lifestyle and, and what they have at their access is not at your access. But number two, that, that performance sacrificing longevity for performance is a huge reality. Um, that mm -hmm. do you find it hard to get that across to people sometimes, or is it pretty, you think they're receptive in your experience? Caitlin, you know, in my, um, in my experience, I've, it's really been amazing. And I think people are almost relieved when I tell them the reality. It almost takes the pressure off, I think, in a sense. Um, you know, and there's certain people that need a constant reminder. You know, I'll, we'll talk about the reality of the situation a month or two later. They're kind of beating themselves up about this or that or so and so, you know, who's my same age, my same stature. Why can they do this and I can't do that? And then we go back and revisit you know, the reality of the situation. So, um, I, and I think, like you said, you know, they are, the people who are the most elite athletes, I don't think that the common 
they're sacrificing, what kind of lifestyle they live. Everything is focused around their sport. I mean, everything, their sleep, their nutrition, their recovery, their social life or lack thereof, um, their family. They, it, it, it's, it's another breed of human that requires that kind of sacrifice. So I think when you break it down to people and remind them of that, they're like, oh, okay, I, I don't know if that's, if I'm willing to go to that uh, extent for for that, and, and some people are, but um, but some people aren't. There's that real life are. balance. Yeah. yeah, but there's that real life balance, right? You've yeah. got people who are working, and some people are working a lot, right? Their parents, moms, and dads. They're they're trying to do real life, right? Everybody's got to run errands. You got to go to Target. You got to go to the grocery store. You got to clean your house. You got to try to work out. You got to get your kids to school. You got to get homework done. Like there's real life changes time and it, it changes what you see. You know, we were talking about social media earlier, what you see on social media, like there's, you know, there, there's the real life aspect and, and the majority, the majority of people that I think we're all, you know, talking to and working with and, and engaging with are, are real humans. And, you know, I say real humans of like, they've got multiple different things going on in their life. Yeah. Yeah, Wearing lots of hats. And I think what Varg was saying about, and I kind of jumped on late. So forgive me if this isn't exactly the point you're making, or I'm kind of going on a tangent here, but this idea of cycling, this idea of hitting different things at different points during the year, um, I, I love that because I think it's applicable to everything and I use it in nutrition. Okay. And, and in a lot of sports, you know, we refer to it as periodization You periodize your training. Okay. Certain parts of the year, you're focusing on certain things. You've got a season, you've got a preseason, you have an off season, you have a postseason. Okay. It's the same thing for CrossFit, for professional athletes, things like that. And it's the same thing for nutrition. Okay. You can't expect to be at your strongest, leanest every day of the year. Okay, it's, it's not sustainable. Um, it's not healthy on the mind. It's not healthy on the body. So I do that with a lot of my clients, you know, because they, no one, everyone wants like a timeline. They want to know, okay, if I'm, if I'm going to diet, if I'm going to be in the calorie deficit and give up drinking with my friends, give up birthday cake, whatever, pizza, you know, how long do I have to do this forever? You know, no. So, and that's a big part of the mindset part, especially for nutrition, um, is I give, I get, we kind of periodize people's stuff. So, you know, so it, for one person, it may be, I'm going to Cancun this summer with my husband, you know, for another person, CrossFit, for example, you know, the, the open, which is typically, um, starts at the end of February every year is, is their season. Okay. So throughout the year, we are preparing them from a hormonal perspective, from um, a nutrition perspective, their breakdown of what we're feeding them and how we're feeding them is changing throughout the year based on what they're focusing on. Everything is focused on ramping up for the open. So they're in peak position, their nutrition's on point, um, hormone profiles on point. Um, so I, I love that idea of cycling or, you know, um, periodization where you're not burning people out by having pedal to the metal all year round. And that's, that's really important. And, and people who understand that I think tend to have better success with almost every endeavor. So you guys were talking about incorporation and stuff. What about when people encounter injury? How do you maintain? Yeah, how do you maintain these uh, the habits, these lifestyles, with uh, with an injury that may inhibit that? Come on, Amy. I see that. I know you have you have a great answer. I can tell. Oh, I'm like the worst because I'll push myself and then I'll get hurt and I keep trying to, <laughs> you were at the gym a couple of months ago and I was like, it hurts and I just keep going, right? Because I, you know, you want to push yourself and I think that you, you know, that it goes back to that whole be nice to your body, be nice to yourself and take care of yourself. When you're injured, 
figure it out. I mean, I, for a year and a half, was walking around on a foot that had dead bone and detached ligaments and I had to have bone scraped and, you know, bone marrow injections and ligaments attached. It took me a year and a half to get back to where had I probably just stopped when I hurt myself the first time, I, uh, you know, I would have given my body a chance to recover and those ligaments to if the ones that were detached, no, but everything else would have, you know, had a chance to heal. And so I just kept breaking bones. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, there's injury. I, I, on the forum, on the YouTube site, there are some questions about, you know, joint issues and back pain and knee pain and, you know, Vargan, Caitlin, I'm sure have stuff to add, add to this, but you know, I had, I had four, three knee surgeries and three knee, knee surgeries and a, and a scope. And, I can run now, but I focused on lifting. I focused on strengthening my glutes, my quads, my hamstrings. And that helped my, my knee pain, right? I broke my back when I was 16. I had three fractures in my back. So, you know, all lifting sucks. Doing deadlifts, you know, I'm opening myself up for that potential to injure myself very quickly. But focusing on the things that we talked about before, the, the low weight, the proper form, um, you know, driving the different – functional aspects those things all played into me being able to do what I can do now and I'm starting to get smarter keyword starting um, about when I injure myself to slow down and and take it by day right you got an injury you got to take it easy but it doesn't mean you know if your injury is not debilitating you're not going to be on the couch but if you're in good health when you have that debilitating injury, you're going to recover faster. Yeah. So what you're saying is if, if for some reason Adam injured himself with the mindset he has right now, he's probably going to hurt himself even more because he's not going to slow down. Um, yes and no. I mean, maybe if he doesn't have the right guidance, um, I think that somebody like Adam's mindset has changed so drastically in the last year that he now at this point, if he hurt himself, he'd go some explicitive and then say, okay, now what can I do to keep moving? What, you know, what do I do? He's got a network of people that he's working with, that he's talking to that he can reach out to and go, Hey, this hurts. You know, what can I do? right? Your legs injured, whatever. Like you can sit and do a upper arm weight. You can do body weight. Your arms injured. Great. Do some leg weight. Keep, keep those endorphins, keep that blood moving, keep that healthy regeneration happening within your body. You're going to heal faster. So you do know the solution to this. So we don't need to worry about you injuring yourself again. Okay. <laughs> I mean, let's not jump to any conclusions. Easier said than done. <laughs> yeah. Right. I'll I call think, Caitlin. Uh, I think a big, a big part of it for injury, you know, I've been, I've got a couple of injuries that are purely from fighting and, uh, I've never injured myself training and I've trained really, really hard. Uh, there were times when I was working as a trainer, I was training myself, you know, 30 hours, 20, 30 hours a week, um, you know, in the, in the boxing gym and in the, in the uh, conventional gym. And uh, I used to squat heavy and I used to throw heavy weight. I don't throw heavy weight anymore, uh, but I've, I've never injured my knees. I've never injured knees, ankles, hips. Um, I've always protected those. And uh, I, I wasn't able to protect my back, unfortunately. But when you get slammed on the ground by very large dudes, it's hard to, it's hard to protect those vertebrae. But so the thing that I really seek to, to, to do for myself and for other people, the advice, the advice that I give to them is, um, you know, attack imbalances first before you start pushing yourself for performance. And the biggest, probably hands down, biggest mistake I see is that you've got somebody that comes in, everybody has imbalances. And somebody comes in with some imbalances, right? They've, they've got super strong quads and super weak, tight hams or whatever it is. And they go for their strengths and they, and they get good performance and they get a personal reward. So they keep doing that thing and they keep going for their strength and they keep ignoring these different planes of motion and these smaller muscles and all this stuff. And then the next thing you know, we've got injuries. 
And when you walk in the door, uh, realizing that the first job we have is finding where your imbalances and your deficiencies are. Like if you have movement pathway deficiencies and you've got postural deficiencies, like we find where those are at, correct those first through a balanced functional full range of motion, like through all the ranges of motion uh, um, tasks, then we can start pushing for performance and injury becomes a lot less likely. Uh, and then uh, after that, it's, it's the standard mantra of form and, you know, not pushing yourself over your capabilities. But I think that very few trainers and very few uh, uh, and even less people who walk in the door of a gym are actually concerned or even aware of, hey, I'm starting to build performance on a faulty chassis here. Like I've got to fix the wheels that are not quite on all the way before I start putting weight on this machine. Um, being the body, right? And, uh, and and so I think that's a big thing for guys that are worried about injury is you got to figure out, you know, do an assessment or have an assessment done of where your where your posture and where your movement pathways there's there's problems there. I guarantee it. Figure out where those are, fix it first, bring the body up as a unit, and then the injuries are less likely when you start to go off task and, and do something that you, you haven't been training for. If that makes sense. Yeah. Totally makes sense. And I would just add from a nutritional standpoint, when people come to me and they're injured, you know, their first thing's like, Oh my gosh, I have to slash my calories tomorrow because I'm going to get so fat now. Um, but I, I tell people we don't change anything. Uh, for at least a week, uh, we need to kind of assess the severity of the injury. What is this going to look like? How long are you going to be out? What kind of adjustments to your programming are you going to make? Okay, what kind of decrease in ener energy expenditure can we expect? And then we'll go from there. And then um, another thing I would, would really push with someone who had an injury, you're, you're dealing with quite a bit of inflammation in the body, so surgery, injury, anything like that. Uh, so food quality will be of big importance, okay? Things that aren't going to contribute to additional uh, inflammatory responses, okay? So food quality, would, would that would be a, a really big focus for someone who was either recovering or had experienced a recent injury. So, Caitlin, in your opinion, or what, uh, based on what you know, what would you say the three most least... You know, what would, how would I say this? Most harmful food habits, food or drink that people usually. Oh, good question, Matt. <laughs> um, it, it, honestly, I'm not going to tell you anything you don't already know. Yeah, um, still. <laughs> I'm real big on alcohol. That's not to say, I mean, I. I love to, uh, I love wine. I love beer. Okay. Like I, I indulge in those from time to time. Um, but if you have fitness goals, if you have weight loss goals, especially if you have performance goals, okay. Alcohol is taking you the devil. away. Okay. From, from those goals, there's tons of hormonal and physiological effects of alcohol. So, I mean, again, stuff you guys already know, um, processed sugar can be really inflammatory and depending, you know, if, if you're a high level athlete and, and you're consuming, you know, three, four, 5,000 calories a day, like, yeah, you're going to be eating Twinkies. You're going to be eating all that kind of stuff. Um, because that's really the only way you can achieve your goal calories. But, um, for my weight loss clients, you know, and it, you know, the, the debate is out like calories in, calories out, a calorie is a calorie. Um, your macro composition is going to play a big role, uh, and certain people will respond differently to different kind of macro prescriptions. Macro and being when, and when, fat carbs. And when I say, yeah, when I say, right, right, when I say, okay, when I'm talking about macro, I'm talking about um, three macronutrients fat, protein, carbohydrates, okay, what humans consume um, the most of. So when I say macro composition, I mean, what percentage of your diet is, or is grams of protein, is grams of fat, is grams of carbohydrates, okay? So, and then, and then that is based 
on a variety of factors, you know, what sport you're playing, uh, if any, what your goals are, uh, what your diet history is, that kind of stuff. So, um, so, so back to the question. Yeah. So I, I tell people, but look, I'm a realist. You gotta, you also gotta live your life. Okay. And, and the best diet is the one that you can adhere to. Okay. So something that's really strict, something that's, um, really, uh, um, extreme. Yeah. Something that's really extreme, something where you're really limiting yourself, you know, that, that might be doable for a few weeks, but not sustainable. Okay. So, you know, people talk about keto diet and all stuff, blah, blah. Um, so I tell my clients, like, they're like, look, my anniversary is coming up or look, I'm going out of town. I'm like, okay, let's put in the work. Now we're going to be real good. And then you need to be able to go out and you need to be able to enjoy yourself. Okay. You, you can't um, be on lockdown forever. And those are the people that have the people that can enjoy themselves and then get back on track the next day or they get back on track when they're back in town. Those are the people that have success um, in the, in the long run. And those are the people that start truly changing their mindset about nutrition, about fueling their bodies. And, and food's not the enemy. It's, you know, it's here. And, uh, you know, just because you ate bad all week doesn't mean it's over. Like, all right, I'll just start. Yeah, I'll just start tomorrow. And I was like, I'll just start my diet on Monday. I'm like, well, it's Wednesday. This started Friday. What's the difference? You know, so uh, learning to reprogram your thought process. It, it, it takes time. You got to be patient with people. It takes time. But um, yeah, so sugar, alcohol, um, you know, I, 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 I like to push food quality simply because people feel so good when, when they're eating quality food. Bloats down, inflammation's down, they sleep better, generally perform better. Um, so yeah. That's kind of, I went off on a tangent there, but <laughs> no, we were that. talking to your question. It's a great tangent. We were talking earlier about, you know, grocery shopping, foodieing of, you know, sometimes the whole extreme of, you know, grass fed and all this stuff. Like some people are on a limited budget. Some people are on yeah. a limited place. Right. And, and a lot of those people when they come, that'll be one of their, I don't want to say excuses, but that's one of the reasons, right? They're like, well, I can go get a meal at McDonald's for, you know, four ninety nine or whatever it is. But the reality is, guess what? You can also go get a, you know, healthy set of frozen vegetables. Like, is that the best vegetable? Maybe not, but it's a vegetable, right? You go get a frozen package of grilled chicken strips that are 98% boneless, skinless chicken strips. You can go get, um, you know, frozen pack of vegetables. You can get some brown rice and all of a sudden you've, you've got a four ninety nine meal, if not a little bit less, and you've got enough for five or six yeah. meal yeah. plans of here, I can change this this way, or I can add this piece in and, and, and it gives you a starting point that is not, not extreme. Right. But then Absolutely. you do, you know, you do that for six days and then, and then on Sunday you, you order pizza and you have a couple of beers. Great. On Monday, you go back to that. I'm going to focus on my protein, my vegetables, and, you know, carbs that are going to be sustainable. That's not me just shoving food in my mouth. Yep. 100%. Now, you mentioned keto. Mm -hmm. I don't know much about it. I hear about it all the time. Is this a fad? Is there, what are some potential long-term bad things to come from this? Oh, it's so hot right now. Everyone mm -hmm. loves keto. Um, so keto, um, or being in a state of ketosis, uh, basically you're reprogramming your body to run off, um, energy from fats versus carbohydrates. Is this long-term or is this a short-term solution? Um, generally it, and that, that's personally what I find to be a problem with it because it, it I mean, how, who, who, who wants or who can sustain that long term, you know, but there, there is a time and a place for it. So I don't want to bash it completely because there are um, definitely some studies that have come out that, you know, it, it can be very beneficial for the right population. Okay. And um, again, it, it, 
go, you have to consider your lifestyle, your activity, what kind of activity are you use, are doing, um, and you have to look at it, what energy pathway are you using, okay? So someone doing CrossFit, I would never put, do keto for a CrossFit athlete. And, 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 no. and that is one of the main problems with paleo is like everyone did paleo forever, you know, when CrossFit was kind of in its infancy. And now we see 10 years later, everyone has adrenal issues because they CrossFit by nature is glycolytic, meaning it uses carbohydrates for fuel. Okay. And paleo, it's very hard to eat a sufficient amount of carbohydrates when you're eating just vegetables, you know, um, not that vegetables are wrong, but think about how many vegetables you have to eat um, for like a high level CrossFitter, for example, to get the carbs you need. So um, generally keto, its application, you know, I see um, is, you know, very overweight people who are generally fairly sedentary okay they don't have like an extreme active lifestyle someone like that um would would benefit greatly okay there's a lot of hormonal implications you know a lot of um women have pcos polycystic ovarian syndrome who are advised to go keto um or at least low carb because you tend to be insulin resistant stuff like that so um yeah so keto is hot right now um most people, I think, believe they're in a state of ketosis when they're actually just low carb. But they they sell things that you can test if if you're actually. But it, it's challenging to actually get into a state of ketosis. So, um, yeah, it's it's got its time and its place. It's not something that I throw around with a lot of my clients. I have some low carb clients, but I don't have anyone who are actually doing a true keto diet right now. Varg, the panel wants to know if you're asleep. I'm not asleep. <laughs> I'm still here. Um, no, but there was an interesting question out there, and I know that you're following this too, Matt, but um, somebody was asking, hang on, I got to find it. Um, I'm curious to what the panel thinks about intermittent fasting. And Caitlin, being the, the nutrition person, which it's actually something we've, Ernest and I have been discussing as well. So I'm super curious to hear what you think about it from a fasting so thing. And I know Adam, who was on before, like literally fast. He only eats between, I think, I may, don't quote me, but I think it's 12 to 8 p.m. Yep. 12 yeah. p.m. to 8 p.m. So, um, again, different strokes different folks you know you look you know people will be like well I love keto I lost so much weight or I I lost so much weight doing intermittent fasting I lost so much weight doing Adkins but you have to look at kind of the mechanism here so with um, keto or with intermittent fasting you're you're what are you doing you're shortening the window in which you're consuming calories okay which for the most part, you would average far less calories than you were consuming prior, okay? So, so the mechanism there is calorie deficit, okay? What happens when you're in a calorie deficit? You're going to lose weight. You're going to lose fat, okay? So, there, um, so, that, so it's not like some magic, you know, science or whatever. Same thing with keto. You know, um, you are – well, that has certain carbohydrate, insulin stuff too. But generally, you're at a calorie deficit. Same thing with low carb. You are dramatically lowering calories in because you're slashing an entire macro category, carbs. Okay, So you are having dramatically less calories in. So, um, yeah, intermittent fasting works for some people. Um, you, you know, you have to kind of – if if you're an active person, make sure you're timing it appropriately around your workout. Um, but it, but if that works for someone and, and they like it and they're getting results and, and um, eating an appropriate amount for them and for their activity level, then I say go for it. I'm not a fan of it for myself. 
doesn't work for me. <clears throat> I know people it works. I tried, for tried it a few years ago too. I don't. I I can. I can do it. <laughs> yeah. Or you get hey, angry. You know, yeah, and and you have to like, think about like yeah lifestyle too. Okay, so <laughs> um, so if you're cut off at six p.m., what do you do if you're out at you know someone's birthday dinner Saturday night and it's and it's eight p.m. You're just gonna sit there with you know no food or. <laughs> You know, and, and more power to them if people can do that. Um, great discipline. But uh, y- you have to, again, just goes back to what what's going to fit your lifestyle. What are you willing to do? What are you not Balance. willing to do? And I, ta- and I have that with all my clients. I, t- I have them tell me up front what are, and I call them non-negotiables. What are your non-negotiables? So someone says, I go out on date night every Friday night with my significant other and we have wine, and we always get dessert. That's a non-negotiable. I'm not willing to give that up. Okay, so we work around that. You know, other people are, you know, I do this, I do that, or I'm not willing to give up soda. I, I love my Mountain Dew, okay? So so you have to work around that, and you have to, you know, because get, getting the buy-in is huge from people. you got to get the buy-in. And, pe- and, again, education drives compliance. Why are you asking me to do this? Why are you having me give, give this up? Okay, you tell them why. You tell them the effect. You know, people are more willing to jump on board. Well, that whole education piece, people are always like, well, I'm hungry, right? They think of the term diet, and then you put stress on yourself to, oh my God, I have to follow this, or I have to, you know, do this thing, and I can only eat this much, or whatever it is. And, and the reality is, if you're giving your body the right fuel, you're giving your body healthy nutrients, and, you know, and not even focusing necessarily on the right gram of mix to start but you just start giving your body some healthy protein some healthy carbs some healthy fat all of a sudden your energy levels change just from what you're eating right you take out Mm -hmm. i mean and believe me i have a four and a half year old goldfish don't even open the bag they'll be gone (laughs) it's a problem (laughs) then the next day i'm like god i want to throw up i feel gross right but it's that whole there's a balance there. It is what it is. But you just, when you start feeding your body the right nutrition, your, your stomach is full. Your mind is content. It's, you don't feel the need to go to those bad decisions. And, and that's been the biggest thing. Um, I'm not going to use his full name, but his, his name is Jay. And we were at uh, uh, IDPA Nationals, and this was three years ago. And he was, he was shooting, he was on a team and we were talking and he kept going, God, yeah, I'm trying to get shaved. I've lost like 10 pounds. I don't do this stuff. And, and he's talking to me and he's like, yeah, I got diabetes. I was just diagnosed with diabetes. And he goes on and on and on about this thing. And we're talking about it. And every time between matches, we get in this discussion as we're also trying to figure out who can do the longest handstand. Um, but we're in this discussion of, you know, sugars and processed sugars, all this stuff. And he opens up a nature Valley bar and he starts eating it. It's like, yeah, this is healthy. It's granola. It's whatever it is. And I was like, are you kidding me? That's not healthy. He was like, no, it is. It's Nature Valley. And I was like, throw it away. Throw it away. Don't even eat it. I'm like, look at the label. Here's some twigs. Yeah, right? (laughs) Yeah, start eating some leaves instead. No, but legit, he looked at the label and I was like, you're telling me that you're a diabetic. You're telling me that you're watching your sugars. And... He opens up the package and he's like, he's looking at it and he's like, oh, oh shit. And he didn't even take one bite. He threw it in the trash can. I sent him, I sent him this list of food, right? Shopping the outside aisle. It was like super basic. The dude lost 70 pounds and was not diabetic anymore after six months. Like oh, that. That's awesome. That's awesome. Right? And it's, but it's some of those simple things where you look at marketing, you look at advertising dollars, you look at these, you know, and it, you know, shame on me for saying it, but you look at the FDA, like there is so much stuff out there that promotes, oh, this is healthy. This is natural, whatever. Look at the package. It's processed. When there's so much sugar in there, okay, fine. If you're going to have it once a day, fine. But if you're living on bars that have 45 grams of sugar, you're screwed. If you are not doing anything to your body. That's great. Yeah. Some people just, 
it, and that's kind of the biggest thing is just bringing that awareness. What are you, you yeah. know, so, and even just asking people to track their food for a few days um, is eye opening. You're like, oh, wow, <laughs> that, uh, you know, Girl Scout cookie flavor coffee creamer. Was, uh, I thought I was putting yeah. like a quarter cup. <laughs> You know, yeah. oh, a serving size, just a tablespoon. I mean, know? don't so, get me wrong. I am a coffee mate, French vanilla. Like, there are things, yeah. right? Those are the non-negotiables. Red sure. wine, those are the non-negotiables. Sure. But, yeah, I mean, there, but there's balance, right? And it's just, you just got to find it. And you got to, I'm just such a proponent, and find the balance. And if you really, truly stand up and look at yourself in the mirror and you go, you know, I want to make a change then commit to it and just start with one thing. You know, one thing, whether it's nutrition, whether it's working out, just start with one thing that week. And then on week two, start with something else. And just each week, add a component so that it's a slow, gradual process that you, you develop the sustainability program yourself versus somebody else telling you what to do. Mm-hmm. You know, and find the people that can help you. Doing it on your own is a bear. It's awful. Yeah. What are some things that you guys do when you eat at a restaurant? What are things you look for? And what are some tips you can give to people listening or watching right now? So oftentimes, so with my, well, for, okay, so I'll start like just with general tips. So a lot of that stuff, you're like, oh, wow, like, why is the broccoli at Outback so much more delicious than the broccoli I make at home? Um, Butter, folks. (laughs) It's butter, okay? That's why it tastes so good. Wow, why does the steak taste so good? Because it's completely saturated in butter. So, you know, you can make crab or mushroom. Yeah, yeah. You know, (laughs) okay, even salads. Salads are huge, okay? Because people are like, oh, I'm eating salads so much healthier. Um, what are they put on that salad? Are, are there a bunch of nuts? Not that nuts are inherently bad, but they are really high in fat. So just a few goes a long way. And for every um, gram of fat, it's nine calories. Okay, for protein and carbohydrates, it's only four. But for fat, it's nine calories. Okay, so... Um, so that's quite a bit different. So, you know, you look at the salads. Is there a ton of cheese on it? Is there a ton of nuts on it? Is there a ton of dried fruit? You know, like I know like cranberries, all that stuff's popular on salads. Those are really high in sugar. You look at the dressing. Is it cream-based? Is it oil-based? Those things have tremendous amount of fat. Okay, so a lot of it is just awareness. Um, you can ask for things that are... Um, you know, oil free, like, please don't cook my vegetables in oil. But for me, sometimes I'll go, um, I, you know, I live in Arizona, so uh, Mexican food is really popular here. So that, that tacos seem to be on virtually every menu here in Arizona. But so I, I usually go for tacos because and then I'll get like shrimp tacos. Uh, shrimp is a pure protein source. Um, Even if they cook in a little bit of butter, you know, you think tacos, there's not a tremendous amount there. Okay. So, and then, um, you know, if they have corn tortillas, sometimes I'll do corn versus flour, a little bit lower fat. Um, You know, be careful of the refried beans, be careful of the guacamole. And again, this stuff's not bad. It's just the serving size is so astronomical. Um, compared to what it should be, you know, at at our portions these days. So, you know, in a lot of it's asking and, you know, if if you feel a little too embarrassed to, to ask, then I would just look at what's what's a lean protein. Okay. So chicken breast, um, shrimp, lean, uh, cuts of, of beef, uh, fish, you know, and, but remember, it's going to be cooked in butter. But if you can get it with something healthy on the side, then you have a balanced meal because you do want fat and proteins and carbs in the meal. So hopefully that helps. It is hard. Sometimes you can look at the – oh, I also recommend looking at the menu ahead of time. You can pull it up on your computer, on your smartphone, um, kind of have an idea going in. 
like where your head's at and where what you can order that that would be you know not totally blowing yourself up I rarely eat out um, but lately I've been traveling and as you know we've been on the road for a good you know two weeks um, and it, it's up and down and I am a sucker for ranch dressing so bad for you it's so good. So good. goat cheese, <laughs> throw it on sour cream. Yes, please. Right. But there's balance. Um, and being on the road, I, I generally like I'll do burgers. I mean, I don't eat a ton when I'm on the road. I'm almost detrimental to my own health because I just won't eat. Um, but I will, you know, I'll do a lot of burgers, no bun, sweet potato fries. Not that, I mean, they're still fried, right. But at least it's not you know, a basket of fries, I'll eat a couple and then I'm done. Right. I try to focus on getting my, getting my protein in. I know what I've eaten for the day. Um, I know whether I've worked out or not. And I just really try to balance it that way. Uh, that being said, you know, I, what we were talking about earlier, like if I can, I go to the grocery store, I throw some food in a fridge and I'll spend the two ninety nine on a package of Tupperware nice. and you know, I'll make a little meal and take it with me or Excellent. make, you know, two or three meals out of that, that package and, and go. And, you know, is uncle Ben's rice, the best decision? Maybe not, but guess what? When I'm on the road, that's my option. And that's, you know, it's better than going to McDonald's or Taco Bell or Wendy's or whatever. Like I can't tell you the last time I had anything like that. Um, Excellent. So I just really, that's how I try to balance it. Huge fan of Chipotle. Um, you know, and, and again, yeah, it's, it's a restaurant, right? So that stuff is cooked in, in different things than you would normally do at home, but it, it's cooked it's in flavor. <laughs> yeah, know, right? cooked, flavor. <laughs> cooked in flavor and full of fat. Um, you know, but there, there are decisions that, that have to be made and you just, you create that balance. And like we were talking about earlier, you know, if I get up earlier, I think, was it Chris was saying that, you know, he got up really early, even if it's Which a short crazy. Medicine, I, but I will get up early and I will go, even if I have to run on a treadmill, I'll go run on a treadmill for, you know, 10, 15 minutes. I'll do some basic dumbbell workout, some squats just to get the body, the major muscle groups moving, engage that core, make that core work. And then, you know, it is what it is. I go out to eat. It's fine. But guess what? I'm a big sucker for pasta carbonara. So if that happens, it is what it is. And you move on, right? It's one meal, you move on. It's when that one meal happens three, three four times a day. Right. I, I, I love what you said because I'll, you know, I'll get text messages from clients like, oh, my God, I just ate. Um, actually, one of my uh, – higher level guys was like, Oh God, I just ate a dozen donuts. He literally ate a dozen donuts, you know, had a little bit of a binge and, uh, or someone will say, you know, oh, just, I a little. just ate that. <laughs> just a little. Just a little. Yeah. Um, and you know what? I think people are hard enough on themselves. Okay. You don't want to facilitate this, this cycle of self loathing. So typically my response is, um, you know, was it good? I hope you liked it. I hope you enjoyed it. And I, and I say that honestly, yeah. you know, like, di like, uh, did you enjoy your margaritas in Cinco de Mayo? Good. Okay, cool. Yeah, tomorrow we're getting back on track. Don't, you know, let it go. Let it go. Don't dwell on it. I'm not going to beat you up. You didn't hire me to beat you up. You, you know, I'm, I'm here to help you. So, um, yeah, so I think that's a great point. Yeah, you have your carbonara, you know, just if you, if you made that decision to have it, enjoy it. Okay, for what it is, don't hate yourself after. You just you just get back on track tomorrow. Wake up the next morning and start over. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Barb, do you ever eat anything bad for you? Yes. Do you eat pizza? Yes. I know Matt does. I saw Matt eating a whole thing of popcorn last week. Oh hell yeah. Um, yeah, no, actually, uh, you know, I, I cook. I enjoy cooking. I cook all the time. Uh I, I cook multiple times a day and I try to eat primarily just what I cook. I, I really try to avoid eating out. It, and there's times where 
I will like you and it never fails. You get caught in like you get up, you do a killer workout and then you're caught out in public and you can't, you're not at home and you're like, shit, yeah. do I stop and get something horrible just to get calories? Or am I going to do like a, a little like fasting session in the middle of this day when I really need some calories? So that dilemma, you know, is probably the biggest problem that I would have. Um, now when I travel, and sometimes I, I travel for classes and things like um, in the last month I've been in uh, Sacramento, Chicago, um, Miami, like those times there's some eating going on. That's not great. Right. And, and there's times when I get done with a class, I might be in an area where there is nothing good open. And, uh, and I don't have the option of, you know, going back and cooking something. I might land somewhere where I don't have the, the facility in my hotel room or whatever. Um, so I don't stress about it. Like I just am like, okay, this is what it is today. And, uh, and I move on. Right. But I'm not, I'm not shooting for that ultra performance athlete thing that a lot of people are trying to reach. So if you're okay with where you're at, you get right back on track the next day or as soon as you get back into town, like you said earlier, I mean, it's just, it's simple stuff. Um, I think what's, you know, it's like eat clean, don't eat a lot of processed shit and sugars and stuff like that. And, you know, keep the butter and the fats and the oils down and the flavor. Yeah, 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 all the stuff that makes it taste good. <laughs> and uh and, and if you're out, you know, just stick by those rules like in as much as possible. It's not perfect, nothing is perfection. And uh and get over it when perfection doesn't happen, you know? Yeah. Well said. Nope. So we've talked about food. I have a topic here to that we probably need to talk about and then from there incorporate both of them together, workout programming. Ah, that's a good. What one. about workout programming? Well, we've got two CrossFitters here, so this is a this is a <laughs> lopsided conversation. <laughs> you got me thrown well, in out of my element here. No, you're not thrown out of your element. We support you. <laughs> Don't worry. Bar, I'm all, I'm already like, where does Varg live? Ernest has a class yeah. in Florida. How can I? How can I get to Florida? How can I come <laughs> have a private training session with yeah. you? Yeah, um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's good. It's just, uh, there's, there's, there's very big similarities between what I do, my personal, uh, mm -hmm. programming philosophy and the way that CrossFit was, was intended to be. Um, so, so I think that whatever you're, I say that, and I, I think, I hope you understand what I mean when I say intended to be, but, um, so I think there's, I'm interested to see what, what your answers are going to be about workout programming and especially as it pertains to people coming to you and looking for help. Uh, you, and then I'll, and then I'll throw something out there too. Oh, he doesn't want to be the first. Um, <laughs> He's I mean, I can start obviously. Me. Yeah, no, obviously I can start. I won't be shy. So obviously at the CrossFit gym, right. They choose the programming. They do it. We follow a, we follow a, a plan it and we run with it um, is comp train, comp train plan. I know you're aware of it. That's, you know, that's what we follow at our gym. Um, we, uh, I do, I did the CrossFit striking program that George Ryan, um, LAPD instructor. I don't know if you know who he is. Um, he started CrossFit striking a couple years ago and I have been to a number of his classes working with him and that, and that's a lot of that, you know, rotational range of motion, right? CrossFit dynamically is very ground to top, you know, straight functional movement and, uh, CrossFit striking incorporates the range of motion, right? A lot like the combat and self-defense. Um, and obviously the combat and self-defense is 100% more hands-on and more, uh, intense, mm -hmm. but I do, you know, we've got a heavy bag. I work on a heavy bag. I have for a couple of years probably more of an aggression thing than anything. Hmm. And, uh, but I, but I love it. Right. I like that range of motion. It's that, that core focus. And so when it, for me, when it comes to programming and I'm working with people who, you know, are a lot of either law enforcement or, you know, military guys who I've met in the industry that want to get their fitness on, you know, I've, I've worked with a couple of earnest, really good friends from the nutrition thing, we get that in check. And then, 
you know, give them workouts. And I really try to focus on that core development along with that major muscle group structure, right? Of, hey, you know, they don't, they don't have a gym in their garage. We've, Ernest and I, over the last four years, have built out our, our garage, you know, workout areas so that we've got to set up here. But some people don't have that. But the basic, you know, add weight. There's so many things that you already have that are heavy that you can grab, that you can do air squats with, that you can, you know, push press over your head to work on your, your arms and your lats, pull-ups, right? That's going to be that total upper body. Um, focusing on your core, your range of motion. You take, if you go grocery shopping, you put anything in your car and take it out, you pick anything up off the floor, like you're moving up and down. So when, I, when I'm programming, I, I generally focus on those muscle groups, and then I also add that cardio piece in there. Um, sometimes the cardio piece is a part of it. Is it burpees? Is it running? And it's not running miles and miles and miles. We're talking 200, 400, 800 meters. You know, get, get those intervals in. Um, get that cardio, get that muscle building, and, and focus on your core. I think that picking those different groups for the basic individual is, is great. Right. And generally there's a lot of people that don't want to pay the money to join a gym. They don't, you know, that that expendable income isn't, that's not in their budget. So what, you know, what can you do with what you've got at home? Right. Like Matt and I were joking last week, like, I'm like Matt, you got kids, you got a seven year old. She's what, like 50, 60 pounds. Good. Pick her up, do some squats with her on your back. I just throw you know? her around. Raise her over your head, play, throw her in the air. I mean, there's, Right, there's so many different things that that can be done uh, on your own that it's it's incorporating the whole body. Cool, Caitlin, how about you? What, how do you approach it? Uh, again, it go and you know this is just a common thread. Depends what your goals are. Okay, if um, you know a, a Olympic thing, I. I to me, they're some of the most impressive athletes on the planet because, you know, it, it takes a tremendous amount of strength and uh, flexibility, speed, power. Um, so I, I love all those aspects. I love that we get to do that in CrossFit. You know, I'm I'm a smaller athlete. I'm 5'3 and, and pretty <laughs> muscular, but 130 pounds. Okay, so I'm, you know, the, the heaviest like barbell. When I met Caitlin, she was like, oh, like five, three, and like maybe, maybe a hundred pounds. Maybe. <laughs> oh, gosh. No. I've been over a hundred since <laughs> for a while. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, you know, obviously I'm partial to CrossFit because I, te I you know, I'm I, naturally athletic. But, you know, I, th I think what, what draws people to it is they – they get to do things and see themselves progress to things that they never thought they could do. So, you know, we get people walking in the door and they see these ropes and they're like, wait, what are you doing with those ropes? They're like, well, we climb them. Well, I can't do that. You know, I can't do a pull up. Okay. You know, and then six months later, I'll be damned. They're doing a pull up. You know, they're, they're climbing the rope or at least, you know, the doing the precursors to that, you know, we've, and it's just, really cool to see and I think when you're an adult um you know because those kids you play sports you have tournaments you have games you get that competitiveness and unless you're on some competitive league as an adult you know it, and unless you're a pro athlete you kind of don't have a lot of opportunities to get that physical competitiveness um that most kids are exposed to and drawn to uh, or many, I should say. Um, so this gives, I think, adults an opportunity to engage in that competitiveness, um, engage in this ability to better themselves physically, see themselves do things. So um, in, in regards to programming, there definitely is a science behind it. Okay, people definitely need to know or be getting their programming from someone who knows what they're doing, who knows um, the application of certain things in certain ways, uh, certain weights. You need to understand uh, the stimulus. 
Okay. So when I'm coaching CrossFit and uh, we, we pay for our programming to be done as well. But um, what I love about it is uh, this company who does our programming, they, for the coaches, they'll do like a quick little video that we can access that tells us what, what is the stimulus of this workout. Okay. And that way, I know as a coach, how am I going to adjust this for the person who can't do the weight as prescribed? Okay, so in CrossFit, we have, you know, generally you call it RX, okay, uh, you know, 95 pound barbell. Well, if I have a female who can't do that number of repetitions at that weight, how do I scale it to where she's still getting the same stimulus for her at her current level, at her current ability? Um, that's someone who's been doing it for six years, okay? Because the stimulus can be the same, but the way you go about it is different. You know, the way, um, you know, someone practicing muscle-ups who can't do a muscle-up, okay, is really taxing on the CNS to be um, putting that much focus, you know, because every attempt is basically a a one-rep max, okay? Uh, Same thing with, working with like an unloaded barbell, for example, you know, that can be really taxing to some people who are learning technique um, so that you can't underestimate the, the tax on the CNS with stuff like that. So yeah, programming is, is I, I love it. It's definitely not um, my specialty. Um, you know, I'm more on the nutrition side, but I do dabble and have some experience, but it's something I definitely want to be more educated on. It sounds like Varg's pretty, pretty educated on that, but, but I love the science behind it and the proper application is great. Cool. (laughs) So I, if I had to say what my main focus would be, it would be in individual programming. It's what I in the pursuit of being a, a trainer and, and, a, and a coach in any capacity, I think my, my personal crowning achievement, like my personal goal was to reach a point where I could individually program anybody who came to me and, and get them to where they wanted to go and also help them see where they needed to go because it's not always where they want to go. Right. So, and that's the big thing with, you know, um, I'm sure you run into that too, but so, and, and I come from old school, old school fitness training, which was, you know, before there was the, before CrossFit, before there was like programming that was done for you. Um, and even before you had some of the, uh, the certification bodies that would do the programming for you. Cause I've been ISSA and NASM and all that. Um, so you had to develop, you had to develop these results yourself. And there was all these, all these gyms, these really hardcore gyms back in the, in the eighties and nineties that were turning out guys in some girls, but it was mainly guys back then that were just super, they were getting super results and in, in, in all of the aspects, whether it be powerlifting or bodybuilding or whatever. Um, and if we take a look at each one individually, there was this great body of knowledge inside of each one of them, but there was still this huge segregation of, of different systems. Like the bodybuilding guys didn't talk to the powerlifting guys. And we had this like huge wall in between each thing and the internet really wasn't like a thing yet. Right. So uh, the Tower of Babel hadn't been torn down. So there was this this segregation of information and being able to go in and like pull that. I spent a lot of time in boxing gyms and in fighting gyms. And I also spent a lot of time in hardcore bodybuilding gyms, like really hardcore, like like roid rage, violent atmosphere kind of shit. Like, and, and so I, I pulled all this different knowledge and basically reached this point where I'm like, okay, uh, performance sacrifices longevity. Let's be realistic. Let's not build a, on a broken chassis. Let's make sure that we fix imbalances. Let's do proper assessments. Make sure that we, if we've got some movement pathway issues, I'm not going to throw weight on top of that movement pathway and make it worse. Right? Like so, basic, like safety stuff like that, but also results driven. So when no matter what a person's goals are 
you've got to be able to help them get inside of their own head and then get outside of their own head. And the reason I say it like that is because they need to get in there and fix what they're screwing up in themselves with their self image and their unrealistic goals and their, and their standards that they're grabbing from the internet or wherever that really don't matter to them, but they think it does. You fix that and get them pointed in the right direction psychologically. And it's kind of what she said earlier about that's, that's where the life coaching thing comes in because you have to deal with all these issues that are grabbing onto these different concepts and holding on for dear life because they're deep seated issues that they're trying to fix with these concepts. They're taking these concepts that they've grabbed from the internet or from these ideas and they're trying to plug them into their life to fix this huge problem that they don't feel good about themselves over. So once we extract that through just basically showing them gently nudging them in a direction that's going to allow the world to open in front of them rather than you telling them, you're allowing them to just come to these conclusions themselves and show them results in different ways. Um, that's the, the philosophy of it. The particulars of it for me, uh, like I'm not in to correct you earlier. I'm, I'm not running a gym yet. I'm still setting up. I'm st I just got here to Florida not too long ago. So um, I brought my gym with me from up North and I just bought um, a boxing gym downtown here and I've absorbed all their equipment. So, um, my my system is is very if you if you know what the the striking crossfit stuff is like it's it's going to you're going to see a lot of similarities cuz a lot of the stuff that you do in those gyms were was being done in boxing gyms for years like ropes and you know stuff like that that stuff was in you know sled pulls and stuff was standard operating procedure stuff in boxing gyms right so i have a large influence of boxing gym conditioning in my in my gym with uh olympic lifting is a very strong um, vein of uh, olympic lifting so all of the all of the strength training is explosive speed training because explosive speed strength is most applicable to self-defense like if you're going to fight you're going to explode you're going to be fast you need to do these things so that's the way we train for those. And, and I have a very strong um, uh, a very strong program for band training. I do a lot of uh, uh, resistant band training. I use the Slastics band, so we'll run out 12, 14 feet with these bands sometimes. Um, and so there's a lot of, like, across planes of motion, different, um, you know, different uh, uh, programming that has to do with just full body attack just with the bands. So, and a lot of times I'll take people through the bands just to start for corrective stuff or work around injuries, stuff like that. Um, just a side note, I know I'm ranting now, but the, the guys who were talking about injury earlier, that, that loading against gravity that weights do, that linear loading against gravity is basically what any weightlifting is. Um, it, you're, you're isolating the, the joint in such a way that you're increasing the chance of, of re-injuring something that's already injured there. And if you do something like a band, the it's progressive resistance and it's not, it's not linear against gravity. So you can control the angles a lot better. You can hook the bands high, you can hook the bands low, you can attack it from so many different angles and you can vary the angles to make sure there's a, a balance in how you're working that joint. Um, and that's why, I've had such a great amount of success with injured people with the bands uh, because you're not limited to that, that linear gravity fight that, that you're just putting that joint through. Um, so those are like, like over like glossing over elements of, of how I would put programming together and how I kind of approach it and think about it. Real life, real life movement. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yep. It's all about it. Well, that seems to be really consistent with, with Varg and many of our discussions, a lot of the things that he posts on his, within his book, on his podcast, it's all about realism and there's, it's not fluff. It's not stuff for show. This is, it, it's real and it's refreshing. I appreciate so there. that. That's awesome. Get it up and running. Okay. Hurry. Yeah, we're it's gonna, coming. We're going to come. Yeah. We're going to come visit. Good. It's coming. It is, it's going to be awesome, too. We'll be there. <laughs> and
And to go a little bit further with what I said too, it's cool how it resonates with people, how people can pick that up and they can, they see that he's going right to the realism or going right to reality and not, and skipping over all the Instagram crap. You know, I want to tell you, I, one of the, when it hit me in the fitness business, I entered into a competition years ago to land a spot as a trainer with this big organization down in Florida, uh, South Florida. Right. <laughs> and the guy who beat me was literally 110% a Tony little impersonator. He had the flare, the flash. Like I was <laughs> fucking blown away. I was like, this is, this is ridiculous bullshit like this is the, the most ridiculous bullshit that you could put inside of a gym and um and when they when that happened i was like you know what i will never ever sell out on my principles i will never be a dancing monkey for this business i don't care if i don't care if a client comes to me and they if they want entertainment they need to go somewhere else because i'm going to give you realism I, I that just that was the turning point for me the tony little guy took my job <laughs> <laughs> it's so true you have to stay true to yourself and it's it's i mean no matter what you're in what business you're in what you're doing you're gonna pop in and say hi you'll make matt happy it'll make matt happy if you come say hi my only husband, if he brings you some I, wine oh matt says only if you bring me wine what up? um <laughs> my husband ernest um the you know you got to stay true to your values you have to stay true to who you are especially as you're representing other people and it doesn't matter who or what you know who or what you're doing be it in business fitness anything like if you're standing if you're standing as an individual behind people that aren't supporting you that aren't part of your team that aren't you know including you as part of the team it's hard to it's hard to be successful and not only that you can't if it's not real and it's not applicable and it's not honest and ethical. You can't, you can't move forward with it. So as someone on the outside looking to go into this, how do you find those real instructors and the real trainers? I mean, I think you can, t I think you can tell, right? When you're talking to people and, and their education and knowledge, it's, it's either real or it's not. It's genuine. I don't know. Cause we, we have these it's, people on Instagram that have these huge followings you, you read know, the great. comments. Go have, go have a conversation with them, right? Go. Do oh, they I genuinely care about what you say to them? Of, you know, hey, look, I've got these issues or whatever. If they don't care, they'd be like, we don't care. Do it, right? Like my dad, if my dad walked into the gym, or, or my brother, and and I can say this because my brother did walk into the gym. My brother's six foot five, basketball player in college. You know, D three, great guy, super fit. And he's like, I don't want to do CrossFit, and eh. But he walks in and what you think because he's an athlete he could do, he can't do. He doesn't have the form, he doesn't have the technique, he doesn't have the knowledge. Him walking into a gym in another city, which he um, may or may not have tried to do, understanding what's going on, if they're not willing to take, take some time and work with him, then, then you know, right? Granted, you're running in class, you only have you know, a certain amount of time, but at the end of the day, there's still, there's still a modification. And, you know, if, you know, Barb's talking about personal training, that's definitely my favorite as well. But when you're running a class, you know, I enjoy that as well. It's a different level of energy. But you, you have to be fast enough to take the time and scale and say, okay, here's what I want you to do. And guess what? You can't do any of this. So here's what you're going to do and think on your feet. And somebody that can do that is knowledgeable. In, in the space in the arena to focus on the stimulus that Caitlin was talking about earlier to, you know, do what they can with the, with the types of movements that are out there and functional. I love what you said, and, and it, I I I'm I'm gonna say anyone. So to answer your question, how do you know who's who's kind of bogus or or, or whatever? Um, I, I believe, and this would, I think, uh, be either nutrition because there are companies that do this, or fitness. Um, if you come across someone who has a templated approach 
if someone has a one size fits all, um, if someone has, um, you're going to eat this amount at this time of day, you know, these five foods, um, or you're going to do eight back extensions. Okay. If it's templated to me, that, that tells me kind of two things. A, they potentially are just in it for numbers and, and money. Okay. Or, and two, possibly a lack of knowledge. So someone who's willing, like you said, you know, I don't want to beat a dead horse, um, to go the extra mile to consider who you are, what's your background, um, you know, like Varg said, find the imbalances, um, that's how you're going to get the real results. And to me, that would show someone who's A, knowledgeable, and B, who genuinely cares and is genuinely passionate about the service that they're providing. So I would say if, if someone hands you a template, run for the hills. <laughs> I agree. There's a, there's a, the background of the person you're going to is important and, and the way that they tell the background is really what they what they prioritize and what they emphasize is gonna if they emphasize certifications and templates and and credentials like that then there's not a lot of substantial background there to talk about in in real experience um if they've if they've been a competitor um pay attention to what they competed in like because the 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 person who placed well in crossfit games isn't necessarily the person who's going to take you where you want to go in bodybuilding or whatever right um or in general fitness like that's the that's the the background part of it is um it, it's what they emphasize if it's their background and their experience how that matches up to your goals and also are they able to transpose what they know out into more than just what they've done. That's a huge thing, I think. Well, and who you are and what you've done, like making that association. Yeah, the application is huge. Anyone can have knowledge, but do you know how to properly apply it? I think is is really uh, key. Well, it's just like in the shooting world. We could have special forces commando dude or SWAT dude and they may be awesome at what they do, and they may not have the ability to teach anything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Scary. <laughs> no, there aren't people like that. No, there aren't. I, I lied. Stop. Stop. Well, should we shut this down and then go to our post? I'm getting a little hangry. Yeah, I can tell. Yeah, what time is it? It's way past dinner time and snack time. <laughs> second, second dinner, what? Yeah, right. So, um, yeah, let's uh, let's wrap that up, wrap this up then. Uh, Varg, any closing remarks and anything that you um, need to pimp while you're at it? No, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not huge on self promotion. If you you need to be looking for some, yeah, I I know. Everybody tells me that all the time. It, here's what I'll say. If you're looking for some real shit, come find me in Florida. I'll take Go you. Go buy his book. Uh, buy his book and then yeah, come visit him. Yeah. I'll, I'll post it yeah. all over social media. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm post his book. <laughs> that's, uh, that's it. I'm, you know, pretty soon the gym's going to be up. Um, it's, it's, you know, I, I pretty soon by, say, let's say this year. Okay. So I'm working on it. Um, and classes are still going on and I'm hoping to do some seminars at the gym. So that'll be stuff that people could travel in to get a couple days of to take back to your gyms. That's some big, I want to be working on. So that's going to be some cool stuff. Uh, and you know, the podcast and things, I'm just, I'm still working at it. So, uh, whatever I put out there, it's for you guys to take and do whatever you want with it. That's, it's all good. And, and I've you have got a Patreon. To, I'd, yeah, yeah, I have a Patreon and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So uh, just look me up. Now, what's this about the book? Where is Where do you buy it? Where, uh, it's on right? Amazon, Amazon Kindle. Yeah, it's on Amazon Kindle. It's been the uh, bestseller in martial arts, number one bestseller for five weeks now, which is 
really awesome. Um, it's it's the paperbacks only available on my website, which is I'm still shipping those out like crazy. Uh, so so those are going hot still, and uh, the Audible version is all it's halfway done. I'm working on it this week, so uh, I'm recording it myself, so it's in my voice, and it's a tremendous pain in the ass. Like it's a, to record because <laughs> you know as soon as you sit down and record, like you like asthma and allergies, and you can't like every possible thing that could happen. <laughs> Like your nose is running. Yeah, Yeah. it's just it's it's unbelievable. But it's it's almost done. It's it's coming. Um, it's gonna be cool. It's uh the the audio book is gonna have some off script rants in it that aren't obviously in the book. So it'd be worth checking it out. Uh, so that'll be done hopefully this month, and uh, and that'll be up there with the Kindle too. So. I'm most excited about you doing the different voices for different characters as you narrate. That's going to be awesome. Yeah. He'll include a goat. We'll give that a try. Just for yeah. You. The goat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Caitlin, how about you? Uh, well, like I said, my nutrition coaching is remote. So you do not have to be in Arizona. We talk on the phone, we email. So if anyone, um, even just inquiry, you know, no pressure. But the email is feed the machine nutrition um, at gmail.com. So if anyone has any questions or just wants to find out a little bit more about the services I offer, I would love any emails. So thank this has been really fun. I thank you for the opportunity, Amy. And then when it's out. Yeah, and then when it's all done, you'll have to start from the beginning and and her all the horrible things that Amy said about you. Oh, stop. <laughs> that is not true. No, I but she's going to listen to it I know. I'll listen to the beginning. I, I apologize. I was late. <laughs> no, no. Well, we already knew about it. No worries. No worries. Um, Amy, what you got? I, uh, you know, I used to have my own identity, and then I married Ernest Langdon, and now I'm Ernest Langdon's wife. Um, but we are, we are <laughs> quickly building... Uh, Langdon Tactical, so check out all the things we do there. And I, my CrossFit and my fitness, that's my, that's my own thing. And can people find you somewhere? LangdonTactical.com. I go mean, for, for your twirler. fitness stuff. Go for, go for twirler um, is my Instagram handle. And people actually think that that means that I actually like twirl actual physical furry gophers. I don't. <laughs> Um, that's from the University of Minnesota. The mascot is a gopher. Um, and you'll basically find mom, fitness, and twirling stuff there. Oh, and some gun things. Gun things. Cool. Nice. Well, thanks to the panel. Thanks to Adam Peeney. Thanks to Chris Henderson of Three Doors Down. I guess Adam Peeney with Knight's Armament. And we'll, we'll add that too. A um, uh, huge thank you to our sponsor, Facts on Firearms. If you're looking for barrels for pistols, rifles, even some AR-15 parts, they actually have them. Check them out, uh, factsonfirearms.com. Primary and Secondary does have a website at primaryandsecondary.com. Through that website, you can find our forum. You can find Primary and Secondary swag. You can find the various channels, audio, video, all that kind of stuff. It's all available for your, for your use. We are on Spreaker. We're on iTunes, Vimeo, clearly on YouTube. Um, yeah, we're all over the place. We have audio stuff, video stuff. It's fun. We are also kind found of on deal. kind of, uh, yeah. I have many leather bound books in my apartment. <laughs> Smells of rich mahogany. Um, Classic. We are on patreon.com slash primary and secondary. Uh, if you wind up deciding it's time to help support the network, your contributes basically help pay the bills. It takes up time. It takes up energy. It takes money to run this whole thing. There are a lot of cogs going on simultaneously. And by helping support the network, you wind up getting some benefits back to, back to you. Uh, one of the one of which is a huge Patreon giveaway. I'm actually giving away a couple short barrel shotguns. These are used 870s I wound up getting my hands on. I thought this would be kind of cool. The grand prize winner, I will pay for your tax stamp. The other two, you have to pay for yourself. Um, as a matter of fact, I think I'm gonna do one of them at the end of this month. 
Um, so if you happen to be one of our Patreon subscribers, you are, you are already entered. So there's that. Uh, next week, we will be talking with Rifle Dynamics. We're going to be talking about AK-47s or AKs in general. Uh, what to look for, what to look for in parts, uh, what it takes to put them together, the proper methods of putting them together. It's going to be a good time. I'm, I'm looking forward to talking to Jim. That will be Thursday at 1800 hours Mountain Standard Time. Let's see here. I think that's pretty much it. Don't hesitate to like. If you haven't already, you probably should subscribe and definitely share. If any of this was beneficial to you, uh, don't hesitate to share because, you know, it kind of is good to spread information or something. Out of it. Well, that is all. I will talk to you all next Thursday. <laughs>